Hi, this is Eric from longboxreview.com. Welcome to the show and welcome to the sixth annual, although we did miss we did miss one year. So this is the Christmas Gab Bag 2023. And joining me as he has every year that we've done this, the sixth time. Welcome back, my good pal and birthday boy as well. <laughs> George from Meanwhile at the Podcast. Hey, George. Hello, Eric. Hello, everybody. Thank you for letting me come back for what I one of my favorite holiday traditions, the annual Christmas gab. It is. It's one of my favorites, too. In fact, uh, as we were talking before we started recording, uh, George and I were, were just kind of talking about our selections that we're going to be talking about today and how basically right after he uh, we were done last year, we both kind of started looking for the comics that we're going to discuss tonight. And uh, it was just like, so my, my comics have been sitting on my desk here for almost a year. And I'm sure it's about the same for George, too. Much like Macy's, the moment the Thanksgiving Day parade ends, <laughs> we start planning the next one. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I hope we have some really good um, uh, choices here. Some different things for me. And, and I'm sure George always brings uh, s some surprises as well. Uh, but like I said, uh, birthday boy, it is uh, uh, at the time of that this is going to be released. Your birthday is, I think, two days later. It depends what day this is released. My my birthday is Christmas Eve, a couple of days before yours. So we're both around the same time. Ah, oh, yeah, it would be a few days before. But yes. Mm -hmm. happy, but anyway, regardless, happy birthday, George. And happy birthday to you, too. Is that why we do this? Because we love the holiday so much because uh, our birthday is around there? Well, you know, that's funny. Because and we just love comics. We, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we love comics because, quite honestly, I I, I can't stand the holidays. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but, but you look so happy, Eric. That's because I'm talking with you. Well, then again, we are recording this in July. <laughs> Maybe we should start doing that. I know, right? <laughs> anyway, the comics are sitting there from January anyway, so why not? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boy, that you bring up a good point there. All right. Well, anyway, um, we're gonna be talking about some Christmas. Comics, Christmas themed, Christmas adjacent, you know, who knows what, where this is going to take us, but I'm very much looking forward to this. But before we get into that, George, mm -hmm. uh, why don't you tell the, the fine folks out there, in case they don't know, in, in case this, their, this is their first Christmas gab bag, in case this is their first exposure to George from the Meanwhile at the Podcast podcast, tell them about your show, what you do, where they can find you, all that good stuff, and then we'll get right into it. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, I am one of the four co-hosts of Meanwhile at the Podcast. It is me, Rodney, also known as the Art Nerd with two R's in the word nerd. Rodney is a graphic designer and Rich and Kristen used to own a comic shop. So they all have their geek cred and we talk about not only comics. In fact, there are many episodes where by the time we get to the end, we realize, oh, we didn't talk about any comics yet. We, we tend to talk about things that are going on in our lives that are a little geek adjacent and movies, TV shows, mostly things that are on streaming because a lot of us aren't hitting the movies as much as we used to, unfortunately. And we talk about comics. We'll talk about music. We'll talk about theater. If any of us venture out to see a show, you never know what you're going to get. We're a potpourri of fun and excitement, and especially around the holidays now. Well, I guess I'm a little biased on this, but I think we're, we're a fun listen. We release our shows every Saturday, so don't forget to subscribe to Meanwhile at the Podcast. And we are on social media at the site formerly known as Twitter at Meanwhile ATP. And we are also on Instagram, Spoutable, and Blue Sky Social, thanks to Eric, at Meanwhile ATP. And we're on Facebook and Meanwhile at the Podcast. So we're, we're on all those platforms. So thank you very much, Eric, for letting me join you again this year. Well, of course. Again, I look forward to this all the time. And thank you, folks, for letting Eric let me come on. <laughs> Well, I, I do know that there are there are some pe some listeners out there who are like they look forward to this every year. So, but but they fast forward through my part. <laughs> no, no, I, I, is, I, I guarantee is, that's not that, the case. I, I have the I, I have the numbers here, and I could swear <laughs> that's what they say. Okay, George <laughs> just held up a piece of paper. I think it was blank, but anyway, <laughs> it was my Christmas list. If anybody wants to know, ah, there you go, there you go. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, you know, I encourage everybody uh, if you've not subscribed to Meanwhile at the podcast. It is a, a great ensemble show. And even when it's not an ensemble show, George, uh, some, somehow, every week, I don't know how he does this, uh, has uh, at least <laughs> a guest on there uh, and, and has great conversations no matter who is on the show. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's one of my favorite uh, podcasts to listen to. Okay. 
So, like I said, sixth time we've gotten together to discuss uh, Christmas comics, George. What is your first comic that you want to tell the listeners about? I was trying to decide what order I would go in, and I decided to go in chronological order. And the funny thing is, each one of these comics is about 20 years apart from, from each other. Oh, interesting. I didn't plan it that way, but that's just how it works. So let's start with the oldest one. And the funny thing about the oldest one is I, I was thinking about this. I bought all of these when they came out. But for some reason, I can only remember and have a visceral memory of buying this first one off the spinner rack. And I think it is because it was off a spinner rack and I was a kid, which makes me wonder if a kid today who actually reads comics, buying them at the comic book store when they get to be my age, will they have as much of a memory of mm. buying them off the rack? Maybe because you can't really do that anymore at a 7-Eleven or a grocery store. And who knows, maybe by the time kids today get to be my age, they'll, they'll all be digital. So, so maybe they will have a visceral memory about picking up a physical copy. Who knows? But this one, for some reason, means more to me than the other two, even though I bought them all firsthand when they first came out. Kind of weird. I, I was trying to figure out why, why did this one have sparked such a memory to me? Mm -hmm. And if anything, I should have forgotten this one because it's the <laughs> oldest. It is from 1978, in fact, which lets everybody know that I am in my early 120s. <laughs> Eric, this is from volume one of Batman, which is really the only volume that counts, to be honest with you. But it's Batman 309 from 1978. And I have no idea why I haven't talked about this comic yet, because for some reason, this cover with Batman and a young lady on an ice flow. And Batman is punching Blockbuster. The cover art is bordered by Holly and Bells, and there's a little caption that says batman have yourself a deadly little christmas sign the blockbuster and at the top of the cover it says the first day of christmas will be the last day for someone on this cover and the only three people on the cover are batman the young lady and blockbuster so place your bets at <laughs> FanDuel, not a sponsor place your bets and we're not responsible for any money you may lose now the fun I was telling Eric before the mics went hot, a lot of times Eric and I, especially for some of these older books, we'll, we'll, after we talk about the story, we, we'll talk about the ads. The ads in here, believe it or not, were looking very familiar to me. And I, I couldn't figure out why, especially there's a Hostess Cupcake ad in here, and I know we all get excited about those. Mm -hmm. But I could swear we had talked about this particular Hostess ad. And I thought for sure it was last year. It turns out it was two years ago. And the, the only way I know this, not because I went into my long boxes, not because I re-listened to the episode or anything, but there's a house ad in here that advertises not only this comic that we'll be talking about, but Brave and the Bold number 148 with Batman and Plastic Man. For some reason, I thought we talked about that last year, but it was actually two years ago. So I would not be surprised if I were to pick up that comic, if all the house ads in there were the same as the ones in here. So we're really not going to focus too much on the ads. It'll just be the story this time around. Anybody who wants to hear about those house ads, go back to Christmas Gab Bag 2021. <laughs> Although on the inside front, front cover, there's the big ad that simply has the Superman the movie logo. And it says, coming for Christmas. Oh, see, I'd forgotten that. that was that released at Christmas time that year? I guess so. That's what it says. Yeah, huh. yeah. Coming for Christmas. Yeah. It's just a black background with the beautiful Superman, the movie logo. Plain white font. It says coming for Christmas. And then it has the um, the credits at the bottom, you know, that you would see at the bottom of a movie poster. And that's it. Very simple. And I think that was enough to get people excited. All right. Have, have yourself a deadly little Christmas. They don't make comics this way anymore. And you know something? Anybody who started reading comics probably in the 90s or the 2000s are probably happy they don't make comics like this anymore. But people like me miss comics being made like this. The story opens with a, a bunch of thugs stealing a purse from a woman in an alleyway in Gotham City. A lot of captions explaining what's going on, trying to set the scene about a, a night before Christmas type of thing. Well, the woman is very distraught, not just because she got mugged, but because everything in her purse was all that she had left. It was all the money she had left in the world. 
somehow, some way, by a matter of comic coincidence, as the thugs are running down the alley, distraught that they only had five dollars in the purse, they run into Blockbuster. Now, Eric, I'm going to ask you really quick about this. I know Blockbuster has played a big part in Nightwing stories, maybe not recently, but was he the mayor of Bloodhaven or something like that? Or what was going he, on? There? Yeah, he was in the, in the most recent uh, uh, volume of Nightwing. Although that has that would that changed over the course of the story. <laughs> so post fifty new post new fifty two and like rebirth era and stuff, Blockbuster was just like a big hulking Hulk, type yeah, of exactly. character. Yeah, but 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 he was intelligent, like almost like kingpin intelligence. Really? I don't. That... No, I'm not. I'm asking you. Oh I no, I I always thought he was he was presented as kind of a, um, a low IQ person. Well, then how did he become mayor? Well, no, late. I, I'm sorry. I, I was thinking of of pre pre crisis version. So yes. Oh, after, oh I see. Okay. After the, yes, after that he somehow yeah he had he was intelligent. Okay. Well, here we obviously have the pre crisis version, <laughs> but but he's even less intelligent here. He is yeah. more like the rampaging. Hulk. Ex- exactly. That's what I remember from from that time period. And it is explained that something happened last issue, which I did not bother to go back and check. But there is a caption box saying that Star Labs did some experiments on him in the last issue that made him even more like a Neanderthal, oh. where, where he like the, the best he could do is just growl. And that's it. But the caption boxes or would give you the idea that he's a little more of a gentle giant than he than he comes off as. Okay. But you you wouldn't get well you you get that from the tenderness that he well let, let let's get let's move on. So <laughs> he he sees what happens and he he is obviously no he obviously knows that these are criminals and that they did something bad to this woman and he wants to protect the woman. He knocks all the thugs out and he grabs the purse from them and he follows the woman home. The woman is distraught enough because now she's lost everything, even though all she had left was five bucks. She should have been distraught prior to that anyway. But now that they stole her purse and the five dollars was all she had, she doesn't have it anymore. She wants to commit suicide. Do we need to put a do we need to put a disclaimer oh that there's gosh. gonna be talk about suicide in this, this episode? Dark. I don't want to trigger anybody. Yeah. It, oh, it went dark very fast. Wow. By page four, she's going into the medicine chest and getting sleeping pills. This is just, and, and this is page four. In, in a comic, in a comic today, this would be the third issue of a six issue miniseries. Who who wrote this? Oh, I'm did I not give the credits? Oh, how uh folks. I'm a little better than this on Meanwhile at the podcast, so please, <laughs> please don't unsubscribe before you listen. Okay, yeah, that, that was that was very poor of me. And I'm glad you asked, because I would be very upset if we went this whole episode and I didn't mention this. The writer is Len Wein. Okay, that 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 kind of makes sense to me. Is, is this tracking for you? Yeah. Now? Okay. Yeah, okay. The artists, and, I, and from the letters column, it seems like these are guest artists. The artists are John Calnan and Frank McLaughlin. I don't recognize the, the the first name at all. I didn't. I didn't either, and I really didn't look them up. Okay. The coloring is by Glennis Wing. The lettering is by Ben Oda, and the editor at this time is Julius Schwartz. But again, according to the letter column, which I'm not going to get into because the letters were really just you know they were just run in the mill. But turns out this is Julius Schwartz's last bat book huh. that he's editing, and the following month he was taking over the Superman line of books oh interesting okay yeah according to the letters page and that, and that included the super friends so it was superman superman family you know whatever else super anything with super in the title i guess but yeah so on page four all four pages all of that happened and now she's ready to commit suicide and prior to taking the pills or maybe the, they don't show her taking the pills so i don't know if she's taking them already but she calls the police department Instead of like a suicide hotline, she calls the police department and the person talking to her uh, says, hello, uh, what is your emergency? And she just she's crying in, in the panel and she's just saying, I didn't know who else to call, but I felt I should call somebody to let them know that I'm done. And, uh, you know, she doesn't come right on say I'm taking my own life. But basically, the guy knows what's going on and he's trying to keep her on the line. Meanwhile. Upstairs, 
Commissioner Gordon is turning in for the night so he can go home. But of course, that man comes through the window and wants to give Commissioner Gordon his Christmas present. Christmas present is tobacco because Commissioner Gordon insists on smoking a pipe. <laughs> Way to enable Commissioner Gordon there, Batman. Yeah, right. In fact, here, I got, the, I got it right here. What do you say? Uh, I just stopped by for a minute to give you your present. The usual, I take it? What else? So long as you keep smoking that pipe, you'll always need tobacco. So I don't think Batman's too happy about it. <laughs> but it is his friend. And, and really, I guess he doesn't know what else to get him. That's all he knows about him, right? <laughs> I mean, the man's a Dark Knight detective. He should know a little bit more than yes, just exactly. that. Commissioner Gordon smokes the pipe. Well, they, they both go down. So instead of leaving through the window, which isn't it bad luck to leave in a different way than you entered entered a, a building? I think that's bad luck. No wonder Batman's all screwy these days. Anyway, so instead of leaving through the window by which he came, he goes down the he goes downstairs with Commissioner Gordon to leave to say Merry Christmas to all the police officers. And one of the police officers says, "Hey, I got you know, I don't know what to do. I got this person on the phone. She she's distraught. She I, I think she's in the midst of taking her own life." So Batman says, "Give me the phone." So he gets on the phone, doesn't even identify himself. Even if he did, who would believe? It's a phone, right? They, they, it's not FaceTime or anything like that. They, you could say you're Batman, Superman, Green Lantern, whatever. Why, why would the person believe? But he doesn't even say who he is. And he tries to talk her down. But she hangs up the phone. They were able to get a trace. So Batman says, I'm going over there. Bring an ambulance and a police car. I'm going over there now. Switch back over to her house, uh, her apartment. Her name is Kathy. And what happens? Blockbuster breaks down the door just as she passes out from all the sleeping pills that she took. And this is the part where, again, captions are telling you how Blockbuster feels, the, mo the, 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 the humanity within the monster, the man within the monster, caring a lot. Batman's uh, swinging around and, again, uh, caption boxes, which are missing from comics today. And I, if anybody out there is like 20 or 30 listening to this and they're like, George, why do you love these caption boxes so much? <laughs> why, why, why do we need this prose? And maybe that's what it is. Maybe I, even though it's sequential art and comics, I guess I did like having the prose like you would have if you read a book, right? Trying to, to describe what is going on. Because if you're reading a prose book, you don't have the picture, you don't have the video to describe the snow-covered town with the people hustling, bustling with their presence dropping money into Santa Claus's uh, bucket for the Salvation Army or whatever. But even though it's in the picture, it's nice. I don't know. I find it I find it comforting maybe to have that extra text. Mm. Now, the face you're making right now is like, I'm over it. But that's fine, Eric. <laughs> I no, like no, the I, caption boxes. I have a fondness for them as well. But, you know, I, if you, if you, if I still think if you, if you, do a comic well these days. You don't necessarily need a lot of extra caption boxes, mm. which mm -hmm. I think some uh, Bronze Age comics were a tad guilty of. I, I like mm -hmm. I said this before at some point on on the show, but uh, I, I I swear that these writers were getting paid by the word, depending on how many, <laughs> how many caption boxes and word balloons were on the on the on the panels. I, I wouldn't have known what it was called when I read it, but I would not have known what alliteration was as early in my life. Oh, Again, right. I, probably did, I, I probably didn't know what it was called, but I recognized the use of the same consonant over and over again yeah. within a sentence. And I loved that. If it wasn't for caption boxes, I would not have that appreciation for it, I don't think. Mm -hmm. And of course, thought balloons, which there are, plenty, there are plenty of those in here too. So Batman arrives at the scene of her apartment, but... Blockbuster has already taken the cradled Kathy in his arms and taken her out of her apartment. Batman sees the bottle of sleeping pills and being the Dark Knight detective that he is, deduces that she has taken the sleeping pills. He's a detective after all. <laughs> also, seeing the door broken down and seeing the footprints in the snow, because again, it's Christmas Eve, it's a snowy night. He recognizes Blockbuster's footprints. Because he's a de detective. <laughs> yes, he, he sees the small <laughs> petite footsteps in the snow of her going to her apartment, but he sees the large footprints exiting the apartment, and he puts two and two together and says, ah, it must be Blockbuster. Of course. 
forced. What other conclusion could you draw? Mm -hmm. Blockbuster lumbers through Gotham and he gets to the hospital. But the problem is because of the experiments that Star Labs did on him, trying to find the caption box, so I guess it's not on this page, but because of those experiments, he equates the hospital with pain. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't want to bring her in there to make her go through the pain that he went through last issue. So he turns around and goes away from the hospital and he bumps into Batman. Now I see you're, you're trying, I guess, to like get the logic for that. So go ahead, ask your question. Yeah, No, yeah. Just so where he was going to the hospital, but then realized that and the he, he arrived. Are... Yes. Because as he got there, I guess some sort of memory popped in his head. Oh, okay. When, when he saw the hospital. He wasn't thinking in, in terms of what that meant. He just knew he had to go to the hospital. Right. Okay. I, I'll buy that. Such compassion. Mm -hmm. Oh, and he, here's the panel where Batman confronts Blockbuster for the first time. And he says, so the footprints didn't lie. It is you. It is you, Blockbuster. Obviously, Star's experiments didn't really kill you as they thought. And it says last issue. So... Something did happen last issue. Blockbuster gently puts Kathy down. And as one does in one of these misunderstanding stories, grabs a piece of building and chucks it at Batman. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Batman avoids it and does his best hand-to-hand -hand combat that he can, but it's Blockbuster and he is a little Hulk-like. So no matter what Batman does, it doesn't really do the job. And <laughs> in the classic... The cape being used as a detriment instead of <laughs> instead of an asset. Blockbuster grabs Batman's cape and throws him around, a la Hulk throwing Loki around in the Avengers. Movie. <laughs> Good comparison there. Uh, <laughs> as Batman's lying broken and bat bruised in the snow, Commissioner Gordon is getting a little antsy, going, "Have we heard from Batman yet? And have we heard from the sergeant? And of course, uh, they haven't." And he goes, "Oh no, time is running out. We have to do something." Blockbuster picks Kathy back up again, and she wakes up, and she screams. But then she realizes that he is not going to hurt her because Blockbuster is crying. Ooh. Now, I don't know if Blockbuster started to cry when she woke up and she started to be scared of him and tried to claw her way out of her arms, or he was just crying because he was sad for her, so like he's been crying this whole time. I'm not sure. But he's crying, and then she said, "Wait, you're crying." Maybe he feels he feels uh, remorse at uh, uh, tossing Batman around. That could very well be. Uh, she says, "I'm sorry. Thought you wanted to hurt me. Didn't know you cared." And then she passes out again. And then he walks away. And then in the panel, as he's walking away, it is Christmas. There's a star in the sky. Of course, yes. Mm -hmm. There we you go. Have to have the star in the sky. Yes. Mm -hmm. with, with no caption box to point it out, I saw it myself. <laughs> Blockbuster walks down the street, makes it over to the Santa Claus that's on the corner. Santa Claus realizes that there's a problem. He takes the girl from Blockbuster's arms, and he's not concerned that Blockbuster is this big hulking thing who's in, wearing tattered clothes in a freezing, snowy night. But then he says, oh, my goodness, this child is terribly ill. We'd better call the police, get her to a hospital. And then Blockbuster goes crazy hearing the word, word hospital. Luckily, he doesn't beat up Santa Claus, but he takes Kathy back and runs off. That man comes to. He deduces somehow that where Blockbuster went, I guess, followed his footprints, makes it to the Santa Claus. Santa Claus says he went that way. Not exactly like that, but I like to say that. I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> Blockbuster makes it to the end of town, to the pier where the uh, where the uh, river is, is uh, frozen over. Gotham River. And with Batman hotly in pursuit, since he feels he can't go back the other way, he goes onto the ice. As they start to fight, since Blockbuster is such a big hulking character, as he stomps on the ice, the ice starts to break. And of course, now the ice flows that we saw on the cover of the comics start to form. And as the ice flows start to shake and shimmy, a la the end of Titanic. Blockbuster realizes that Kathy is in danger and he's the one who put her in danger. So he picks Kathy up, as one does in a comic book, and throws her across the river 
to Batman on another ice floe. And as he does that, that action makes him fall off the ice floe. And he gets submerged and he doesn't come back up. And as we all know, he somehow survives if he becomes the mayor of Bloodhaven. <laughs> but as this issue ends, Blockbuster is dead. 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 <laughs> uh, Eric is making the, the air, air quotes. <laughs> and Batman asks her if she is okay. And well, actually, what he does is he tries to say, Blockbuster sacrificed himself. Obviously, he thought you had a lot to live for. Are you going to make a liar out of him? And then she responds, You mean, am I going to kill myself again? No, there's been enough death already tonight, more than enough. And then she says, it's so strange, Batman. He died for me, and I never even knew his name. Who was he? Batman's response is, is it important? Why not call him the spirit of Christmases yet to be? Goodbye, Kathy, and good luck. Last panel, since we're here, I may as well give you the last panel. Then, as the ambulance howls off into the night, the commissioner asks Batman, do you think she'll make it this time, Batman? And Batman says, if there's any justice in this world, Commissioner, if there's any justice. And now there's a caption to point out, and a single burning star in the sky lights their way home. The end. For some reason, I remember reading this darn thing when I was a kid and loving this. <laughs> I read the heck out of this book. <laughs> so... uh when you were introducing the book, I, I looked it up uh, on Mike's mm -hmm. Amazing World. And by the way, uh, I think this, this would be my first opportunity to even talk about this. But uh, if you're not familiar with Mike's Amazing World dot com, it's a great resource for comic book fans and podcasters alike. Uh, but unfortunately, the uh, the Mike of Mike's Amazing World recently passed away. Uh, there was an announcement on the website about this, and I think the news broke uh, a week or two ago as, at the time of this recording. Anyway, um, it you know, uh, I I have used Mike's Amazing World uh, as a resource for years, and have appreciated uh, the effort that Mike put into this website. And and for you know, like I said, all all the comic fans out there. So anyway, I you know, I wish his family well. Uh, um, you know, especially since he died right right before christmas. So I guess we're continuing that that uh, d dour note that uh is Batman 308. <laughs> but oh, gosh. um uh I did or 309 I should say. Um uh I uh because I'm also doing uh some recent shows that in fact one will be released shortly after the release of this episode uh where I'm kind of uh, going back through my comics past, my comics history. And um December. So this 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 comic book was on sale according to Mike's Amazing World uh, on December fourteenth, nineteen seventy eight, which means it was on the stands shortly, just a few months after I started buying my own comics and started that oh. forty five year love affair with with this medium. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's very possible that I saw this on the in a spinner rack or a magazine rack. Uh, but unfortunately, I you know I just didn't have the money <laughs> or maybe the interest. I don't know at that time to get this. Well, you know we do we have talked about cover price in the past, and again, I'm not being a very good podcaster, I guess. But it was a forty cent comp. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, okay, so uh, as as the cover said, uh, the last day for someone on this cover, right? I was guessing it was going to be blockbuster over mm -hmm. over the the, uh, the 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 woman and the the damsel in distress here. Uh, <laughs> considering I, I, I really, I really thought Batman was going to be a god. I'm, I'm sorry, my money was on Batman, which l <laughs> lets you know why you know I'm really yeah. not a successful person. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, it turns out that Blockbuster appears uh, just two months later in <laughs> Justice League of America 166. He's back. <laughs> so there you uh, go. Uh, well, that was great. Well, uh, th thanks, man, and just uh, so. I'm not going to talk about all the ads in here. Just let everybody know there is a Hostess Cupcakes ad in here. Wonder Woman versus the Cheetah. Uh, again, I may go into more detail on this back on the episode from 2021. I'm not going to go into detail here. It's just basically Wonder Woman versus the Cheetah. So 
and she wins the day by giving her hostess cupcakes. Because then again, isn't that how we all win the day? Exactly. By, mm-hmm. by, yeah. by eating hostess cupcakes. Mm-hmm. Um, we mentioned uh, the artist uh, John Kelnan earlier. Yes. And so I was just mm-hmm. curious, and I looked up uh, his credits. And uh, he's been working, at, he had been working at DC since oh. 1966. Well, uh, in terms of the art that, that was published. And he worked on a lot of the, um, it looks like he worked on a lot of the horror comics, like Witching Hour, uh, Unexpected Ghosts. Also, um, some of the um, military comics, Our Army at War, Our Fighting Forces. But then he has a bunch of credits for Action Comics. Um, world's finest comics, and then you know, uh, some Batman stuff in here as well. And it looks like he has credits up through September of 1982. So he had a a long career at DC Comics. I I like the artwork in here. The layouts were good. It's funny you mentioned the artists. I mean, just talking about the letter column real quick. In the letter columns, they mention people like Michael Golden mm. and Ma- Marshall Rogers. Oh yeah, great. So, so, so yeah, so at about those those times, you, you could find their artwork in Batman comics. Oh yeah, Marshall Rogers was so good. Oh yeah, unbelievable. In fact, was, well, I mean, one of the reasons why I was probably still picking it up, my, I, I do have to admit, it was probably because of the Batman TV show, because it was on in syndication after school. Oh yeah. Because my my brother, who was younger than me, really did like Batman. So what would happen is he really wasn't in the comics. Not in the way I t- on my show where I talk about my nieces and my nephews that just don't like to read for some reason. I don't know. They they loved it when they were really, really little. But now in their teen years, you know, they're too cool for school, I guess. Right. But my brother, because of the show, I think, liked Batman. So in addition to the Archie and Richie Rich and Casper comics and stuff like that we were reading together, he would read these also. Oh, wow. He, he might not have gotten as much out of it because he was a little bit. You know, we we don't have just like a year or two apart, uh, so he may not have gotten as much out of this as I did, but he he did enjoy reading. So they they were well loved by the both of us. Good. Hmm? See, I didn't have that. Hmm. <laughs> For my first entry into this gab bag edition, I uh, I I wanted to do something different. So normally. I have a lot of uh, DC comics that are Christmas related, and it's just because I collected a lot of those particular mm-hmm. publishers' issues. Are you going down the road of like a Monty Python, and now for something completely different? <laughs> exactly, exactly, and okay. that's exactly mm-hmm. what I wanted to do this year. Well, and... look out for that big foot that's about to come down <laughs> on your head there. <laughs> I'm not dead yet. <laughs> so, uh, so I uh, I happen to be. Um, in uh, my granddaughter Madison's room, actually shortly after George and I recorded last year's Gab Bag, and she has a bunch. She I had acquired a bunch of uh, Archie digests for her, and she for some reason I think those are out. Anyway, I'm I I happen to spy a few. And I'm like, you know what? I bet you there are some Christmas strips in these digests that I could use. So I went through the bunch and found a few of the digests and just so happened. Um, well, first of all, I found, I found three, took them from Madison's room, stuck them in my office and they've been sitting there for months. And it was only in the last month or so that I actually sat down and read through them all. <laughs> so in your thorough cleanings <laughs> yeah. all throughout the year, they've been dusted. They've been moved around. They've been moved around. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> But but what I did find you read all three in full. Well, no, I I was just flipping through them looking for no oh, Christmas, Christmas stories really. because right. because these digests. Okay, so I'll, I'll show George here on the on the video. Yeah. But because this, I, I love the Archie Christmas, uh, you know, like I, and, randomly buying a digest. Or and I whatever. knew that yeah. I knew that about you, so mm-hmm. yeah. I thought you might appreciate this. But anyway, this yeah. is this is the World of Archie Jumbo Comics Digest number one hundred four from wow. November of twenty twenty. Nice. And I love that cover. But it contains um, reprints from all various kinds of Archie comics, right? Hmm. And so I read through all three. Well, I flipped through all three of them and actually found two stories. And they're they're really short. So I'll go over both of these. But there is a common factor involved Ooh. in both of these stories, even though they were originally published years apart. And so the first one is uh, called... Just because, 
Mm, I see what they did there. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is by Frank Doyle, Harry Lucy, Lucci? I'm not sure. Lucy, it's spelled L-U-C-E-Y, and Bill Yoshida. Uh, this is actually from Archie Giant Series Magazine number 179, published in October 1970. Uh, with And it had a cover by Pat and Tim Kennedy, uh, Bob Smith, and Rosario, Rosario Tito Pena. In this Just Because story, Jingles, are you familiar with Jingles, George? Reach it, reading uh, Archie I comics? am, yes. Okay, okay, mm-hmm. good. I had no and idea. I think they've... Recently, I think they recently added a new uh, elf type of yes, character in I, the last couple of years. I read about that too in in my mm. in my uh, uh, deep dive into Jingles because I had to find out more <laughs> about this character. Anyway, Jingles, uh, Santa's freaked out little helper, as Reggie describes him, <laughs> arrives, just pops in to uh, to to uh, with the gang and and uh, is there to lament uh, that there's an imposter, a fake, a phony running around calling himself. St. Nicholas, and taking all the credit for Santa Claus's work. And Jingles is there to expose the fraud. However, Betty tries to clear up the confusion, you know, that uh, St. Nick is Santa Claus, but Jingles isn't buying it. So Betty decides to tell him of Santa's origin. So you get a little a little history lesson. in the, And this is, you know, I, this is one of the things I love about comic books Generally speaking, uh, especially when I was growing up, is I learned so many things about the world, about uh, literature, about science fiction, concepts, things like that, from reading comics. Like you were talking about alliteration earlier. It's things like that where it's like you get to introduce these things because the writers are just tossing in little bits of of information that they, they like or they think is pertinent or whatever. So here we go. This is Santa, according to Betty. (laughs) Uh, So in the ancient town of, uh, I'll say Laika, in what is now Turkey, a kindly old man named Nicholas took gifts to those in need. In Germany, he's called, let's see, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce these things in the way that they should, but Pels Nicol, or as she says, Nicholas in fur. The Dutch called him Sinterklaas, Class, sorry, center class, and the English children, when they were introduced to this concept, pronounced center class as Santa Claus, or well, Santi first, and then Santa Claus. So it just kind of evolved over time. The center class, at least we we knew about that from Miracle on, Th- yeah, Miracle on Thirty Fourth oh, Street, right? Because oh, the thought, little girl, right? I thought that sounded familiar. Okay, yeah, it's that, been a the, while since I, I've seen that. And the uh, well. Well, the girl is sitting on uh, Santa's lap because she doesn't know English. Uh, Santa sings the song uh, about Santa Claus with right. her. That's right. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. I got to watch that so, movie. So, so yeah, that, that, that sounded familiar. So that's pretty pretty okay. cool. Uh, anyway, ergo, says Betty, St. Nicholas is also Santa Claus. But Jingle still isn't convinced. Uh, <laughs> Jingles. <that> jingles. <laughs> yeah. Jingles, says Betty, Santa doesn't have to be a fat bearded man in a red suit. To which Archie, Archie replies, she's right. There's a little Santa in everyone. Huh. Jingles points angrily at, at Archie, declaring, mutiny, it's a mutiny. You're all on report. And he calls Santa, who then tell Santa then tells Jingles to listen to Betty, quote, she's telling it like it is. And it ends with uh, Santa in his sleigh with the reindeer flying around the world saying Merry Christmas. Nice. <laughs> Why does that give you such joy? A little, what was it, like five pages, six yeah, pages? Yeah, it was, yeah, I think it was like six pages. Yes, even to this day, that gives me such joy. Yeah, yeah. So, let's see here. Uh, because of this, I had to find out more about Jingles. And okay. <laughs> uh, I think I have some notes about that, actually. They so got Archie's who's who Yeah, over here there? we go. Okay. <laughs> I have some notes for the, after the next after the next uh, installment here, but I but I but I just I this the idea of this this uh, one of the Santa's elves just kind of popping in. I <laughs> I now want to go back and find the original, you know, the first appearance, mm-hmm. and then track this this character through Archie comics appearances because it's, he just seems like this weird little interloper in their lives, and you know, it's just it's Christmas related. So anyway. Mm-hmm. I find it interesting. So the five core gang, 
Archie's gang is there, but Veronica only gets one line in this, and usually okay. she's featured a little more prominently. Jughead is there, but says nothing whatsoever. But that's okay because it makes up for it in the next one. He's eye candy, and <laughs> and he's <laughs> and he's not wearing his trademark crown hat. Wait, how old was this again? The original seventy something. This eh? is nineteen seventy that this this story appeared. Mm. Yes. All right. So the next one is called Elf Help, and this is by mm. Craig Boldman, Rex Lindsay, Rich Koslowski, Barry Grossman, and Bill Yoshida. And this is from Archie's pal Jughead Comics number one thirty four, published in December of two thousand. So, you know, thirty years later, we uh-huh. get uh, another appearance of Jingles, but this time he's not there to complain about uh, uh, imposters. <laughs> So what happens in this one? Reggie is up to his old tricks, playing pranks on his friends. Uh, he slams whipped cream into Jughead's face, Jughead's face and trips Archie at one point. Uh, Jingles then appears to Jughead, who calls him Santa's non Jughead, who calls Jingles Santa's nonconformist elf. And I thought, well, that that's interesting. Nonconformist. Well, <laughs> again, it's like, what what is this? What is this character? What what is he supposed to be here? So Jingles recognizes what a uh, jerk Reggie is being. And he says, that guy needs an infusion of Christmas spirit. Not, not just coal in the stocking. We exactly. need to do preemptive, a preemptive strike. Jug- so Jughead offers his support, uh, saying to Jingles, it's easy. Just make him the opposite of the way he is. I mean, that, that seems like perfect uh, Jughead logic, right? Worked on the Seinfeld episode where everybody did everything the opposite. <laughs> oh, that's so that's right. Not? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Jingles wonders how hard that actually could be, even though he's never tried that trick before. Ooh. And so Jingles works some elf magic, I guess. And after after that, uh, Reggie suddenly wants to go Christmas caroling. Oh, it must have worked. But then Jughead notices that Archie is twirling around like a ballet dancer after having fallen off a step stool. And as any long-time reader of Archie Comics knows, Archie's a little bit of a clumsy guy sometimes, right? And yet all the girls love him. (laughs) Exactly. That's right. Betty is now imitating Scrooge and threatening to give everyone itching powder for Christmas, which is... Uh Veronica is dressing as cheaply as she can in a box, a dress made out of a box, Uh a, a cardboard box. And car and and uh, wearing cardboard shoes, box boxes for shoes. Uh, Midge and Moose repulse each other; they can't stand to be around each other. And now, and Jughead is even affected. He now just wants to eat healthy foods. And dogs and cats are living together in harmony. <laughs> so anyway, Jingles finally recognizes this. Uh, after a few panels of of weird things going on, reverses his earlier spell with I love this in uh, as uh, as they show this instead of a, a zing, which is the, the the sound effect that they showed when he first cast the spell, they do a nizing. <laughs> is it G N I Z? It is. Yes. It yes. is. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Or oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I screwed that up. It's 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 a niz. Zing spelled okay. backwards. My notes were okay. that too too close together there. Yeah, niz instead of zing. I'm not going to attempt to try to pronounce Superman's impish adversary. What? Mix just piddle? But let thank you. <laughs> uh it, it's kinda like I was gonna say, well, just say he's like that might, but he's gotta do yeah. that backwards thing. Right. Yeah, okay. Very good, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, very good. You know, I, I did talk about uh, uh, Mixtias Pitalik in a, in a recent episode. So, um, uh, anyway, you're a professional every- <laughs> podcast. <laughs> so at that point, everybody's back to normal. Reggie does tell him he kind of liked the Christmas spirit stuff and thinks he'll keep it up, though. It's a Christmas miracle. <laughs> uh, Jingles announces to everybody that he accomplished a good deed after all, and then trips because his shoelaces are tied. Oh, guess who? <laughs> As Reggie walks off, he tells Jingles, hey, some habits are hard to break. Christmas carols, anyone? <laughs> I wonder if Archie and the gang dread after, like right after Thanksgiving ends, 
they're dreading like, okay, when is this stupid little guy going <laughs> to pop up out of nowhere? Exactly. Like, I'm going to the bathroom or I'm trying to go to sleep or something. This stupid jingle <laughs> elf is a imp is going to come around. So like I said, uh, the first story was- That's worse than elf on the shelf. Uh, yes. Uh-huh. Well, the, well, I don't know. There's, there's not much worse than elf <laughs> on the shelf. But anyway- so yeah, the first story was 1970. This one was 2000. But Jingles has been around. Like I said, I did some history uh, searching since 1961. Mm. And oh, I, I forgot to mention this. Um, Jingles in this later story is now slightly big, shown slightly bigger in oh. in stature and blonde instead of dark haired in in the the mm. first story that I I talked about. Um, so you know maybe he was going through a mid elf crisis. <laughs> uh i find it i find it, i found it funny in this particular story that uh reggie is getting a lesson in playing tricks when it's a prank that's pulled on him mm. so i don't know and i you know it was it was cute to see that everyone was given one panel just one to show <laughs> their opposite selves so they didn't that's that's the thing i liked about both of these stories is that you know, they they were they were they were six pages and five pages respectively, and it's an entire story. It's just you know, well, okay, it's it's a little more than a gag, but but you know, it the compact way in which both stories are told, so you get enough out of it, you get a bit of a laugh. It's fun to see them, you know, doing Christmas stuff, but it's not overtly Christmas, other than the fact that it's a Santa's little helper. Um, but but my final my final question as I was. Uh, um, preparing my notes, George, was kind of like what you were getting at. Why do they hang out with this elf? I know, right? <laughs> he only causes trouble. Yeah. Threatens them with t- putting them on the naughty list uh, or, or, you know, using some magic that goes Ari. So, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> but yeah, that was fun. I, I quite enjoyed the the my little uh, uh, search through uh, Archie Christmas stories. Now I forget. It's been a while since I've read an Archie Digest with a Christmas picture on the cover, because what they've been doing a lot lately is they've been releasing those trade paperbacks of Chris, Archie Christmas stories, and I've, I've got a few of those over the, over the past couple of years. So that digest in particular, it was a mix of Christmas, holiday, winter themed stories, and then other Archie stories in there. I mean, those digests are pretty. What are they? Hundred pages or something? Uh, yes. Something like that. I don't think that yes. there's actual pages in here. No, there's not. So yeah, yeah. yeah there, I it's mean, a mix, there were, right? There were, yeah, there was a mix. There, there's, there's actually a, uh, a few more Christmas stories in here mm-hmm. besides these two. It's just these, these two were the ones that, that I thought yeah. were, were fun mm. to, to go through. But yeah, there's all sorts of different little humorous Archie stories. I still don't understand why they can't. They, it, well, I shouldn't say they don't put out at least one monthly book because it does seem like Archie will put out one monthly or one quarterly book for the season. Like there'll be a, a summer, uh, Betty and Veronica's summer vacation and just be that one issue or there's, there's one for the holidays now. And but But they don't have that one title that has four or five five page stories like they used to. So. It makes me wonder, A, there's no market for it, I guess. Although there's that webtoon or it, it, there's that itty bitty Archie thing that they do online. I don't know if it's a webtoon, but it's an online comic. And it's been popular enough that it has a print version, which makes me think that people can take those bite-sized versions of a story and stomach them and enjoy them. So it it would be nice. To, I don't know. In my mind, instead of having these one shots from Archie to, and they've, they've been focusing on the horror every month and they, they are one shots, but it would be nice to have that one core Archie or pep bring back pep mm-hmm. or, or, or Archie's pals and gals, like you were mentioning before, just have that one title and have that every month with the gags. in. It. This coming from a 50 year old man whose grandfather would say, why are you still reading these funny books? <laughs> if he, if he were still alive, but I, I don't know. It might be. It should be an easy sale to a kid who's also picking up. If a kid's going to spend the money, a lot of people probably say, you know, it's not like they're a quarter anymore. Yeah, I, I was just, I was just looking at that. The, this digest when it was, you know, newly on sale, uh, seven ninety nine. 
Okay. For, for probably but, uh, about 100 pages, yeah. But, I mean, if parents are buying their kids a comic, uh, I don't know, Darkwing Duck or one of the Star Wars books that's geared toward younger readers or something like that, if they're willing to pay the money for that, should be willing to pay the money for an Archie book. Mm -hmm. so, I don't know. I, I don't know. I just I just think something's missing out there, but well, I, I don't know the market. I guess the market it just isn't there for it. I mean, granted, this this came out in 2000, but um, uh, when you consider that these days a number one issue can sometimes be 6.99 for what 24, maybe 32 pages, something like that. Mm. Uh, compare <laughs> comparatively, this is a this is a good buy. Right, and and the Archie books that are coming out that are like what I just described, they're they've been holding that at 2.99. Oh, really? Yeah. And actually, I even think like when they do the Scooby-Doo uh, Batman adventures, mm -hmm. I think that DC is holding those to two ninety nine. dollars So some people are trying to hold their books to $2.99, uh, at, at least gearing them toward kids, I guess. So, but anyway, that's, I, I miss Archie. Yeah. So th that was great. That was a good call. Yeah. That was, that, like I said, that was a lot of fun. I, that's not something, I have not read Archie comics, you know, classic Archie, Archie comics in. I'll probably I'll just say decades. So it was yeah. it was nice to to revisit that. All right, what what's your second comic? We are jumping about twenty years into the future from that Batman comic that we had. And we're going to nineteen ninety seven, the fun and frolicking days in nineteen ninety seven. Now this one has, I, I'm not going to get into all the details in this one. I, I encourage people to read it if they haven't, and if if you have it in your long box somewhere and you haven't read it in a while, pull it out. Because there are a lot of things that were in this book, this 25, 26 year old book, that you might say to yourself, "How did the writer know this was going to happen in the 2020s?" So there's, or or it just means nothing has changed, one or the other. I'm not sure. And I am talking about the Howard the Duck holiday special from 1997. Now, if anybody remembers Howard the Duck, Howard the Duck was a uh, great uh, satirical book from the 70s, uh, written by Steve Gerber. Uh, Howard the Duck was first in Adventure in the Fear 19, and then he got his own book. I believe it was not only created by Steve Gerber, but the artist Val Mayerick. Uh, but anyway, the one thing that I, I love that Howard the Duck series. At the time, it was over my head. But I just loved picking it up off the rack because, I mean, let's face it, he looked like Donald Duck, and he looked and he looked like Daffy Duck. You know, he he looked like the the cartoon ducks that I was familiar with, but he was like Ben Grimm, yeah, with smoking smoking the cigar. He he was a little rough around the edges. I didn't necessarily grab all the humor, but now that I've read it in later years, I'm like, holy cow, this stuff was really out of its time. But this Howard the Duck came a lot along a lot later than after the Howard the Duck series ended. But what I like about this is that he's drawn in the way that he was originally drawn as opposed to how he's drawn now. And I don't know if they draw him now the way they do because of legal things, although now that Disney owns Marvel, they shouldn't be afraid to have him look like Donald Duck. And, and and I see the face you're making. So do you understand the, the difference I, I'm making in how he's drawn? I think so. Does, does he look more like he, the, the character did from the Howard the Duck, the movie? You know what? He does a little bit. He's more rotund as opposed to an anthropomorphic. His, uh, his, the, the, his dimensions just seem like he, everything was... Uh, drawn to size whereas the way he's drawn right now you're, you're right kind of like his body's almost egg-like his beak isn't as big as uh what you came to expect from the original howard the duck so i'm glad that back in the 90s they were still drawing him like this yeah good it has a wraparound cover beautiful wraparound cover oh nice yeah uh but it is kind of like a 90s style i i don't know how else to describe the artwork and this time i will make sure to tell you Wait, does that mean that um, uh, Howard has a bunch of pouches? He he does not have a bunch of pouches, although there's somebody else in here who does. But... <laughs> okay, well that tracks then. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the well, uh, I'll, I'll get into it. So the story is called "Wreck the Malls with Hydra's Folly." You see what they did there? See, Archie's not the only one. Yeah, that's right. You see, you see what they did there. 
All right, so, so uh, here, here, here we go. You, you ready for these credits? Larry Hama Ooh. is the writer. Yeah. Jamie Mendoza and the workshop world of Hack Shack Studios are the inking elves, and Pasquale Ferry is the penciler. Jonathan Babcock is the calligraphy elf. Joe Rosas is Herbie the four-color dentist. Professor Felder is Yukon Cornelius. <laughs> and... <laughs> Big Bob Harris is the bouncing bumble. <laughs> uh, all right. So where are we going to start here? Okay. Uh, being a Howard the Duck story, there's a lot of satire. There's a lot of, there are a lot of gags in the background. I'm obviously not going to touch on them all, which is why I was saying if, if you've got this book, you know, the things in the background, uh, you, you know, that's, that's all, like, for instance, How Howard's working at a video store. If anybody doesn't know what a video store is, look it up. Yeah, but one of the videos he's handing to one of the people who has a ton of videos in her hand is Peter Porker Returns. Ah. All right. So keep in mind that the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man came out in 2002, I think. Definitely, definitely in this century. That sounds about it, right. It, it wasn't in the 90s. There are references in here to, well, here, he's handing her uh, this on, on, in this, on the splash page, Howard is working at a video store. He's handing somebody Peter Porker Returns. Somebody is complaining about one of the videos that he had recommended to them for the holidays. And he said, well, what about this one? The Wisconsin Weed Whacker Massacre. It's a staff pick. A whole busload of teenagers get whittled down the giblet gravy by a spinning piece of plastic string. Or Joe's Condo. Singing and dancing roaches descend on Donald Trump. If only that were true. I know, right? And only, it, that must be a reference to Joe's Apartment, which was an MTV show back in 1997. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Because this is 1997. Or, okay, so first of all, the Donald Trump reference. I, I love to remind people who are younger than us that Do Donald Trump's name has been in the zeitgeist since the 80s. Mm -hmm. To throw him in here. And again, he's no political aspirations. He wasn't president or anything like that, but just to show how people felt about this guy even back then. Right. Yeah. Or get this. Okay. So, so Howard's saying, or Joe's condos singing and dancing roaches descend on Donald Trump, or get this, the live action Spider Man movie. It makes me wonder were there talks at that time for the Spider Man oh, movie? Oh, I right? had to have been. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. Well, somebody hears that Howard mentioned the Spider-Man movie. And they say, that one isn't even in production yet. And Howard says, okay, so the video release is a little premature. Give me a break. Well, then all of a sudden, somebody in the back of the store whips on a helmet and says, I'm going to say it exactly as it's written. Let me see that. Aha, I was see. I'm Judge Elmer Dwed. So his helmet, his helmet is like like a judge from Judge Dredd from uh, 2000 AD. Oh my God! But he's talking like Elmer Fudd. In typical 90s fashion, all of a sudden now, what it's not what happens, it's how it's drawn. Howard's longtime girlfriend Beverly comes rushing in dressed in a skimpy. Well, it's not skimpy because I mean her whole body is covered, but it's nice and tight, showing all her curves. She's dressed in a Santa Claus costume and saying, Ducky, it's a catastrophe. You have to come with me right now. So she grabs Howard away from Judge Elmer Dwed and drags him to the mall. Of course, the Judge Elmer Dwed will be in, in, in pursuit. But Beverly says that there is a big emergency. And again, in 90s fashion, I mean, I guess this happened in all comics in the 60s, 70s, whatever. But the shot of Beverly running from behind. It really does, you know, focus on a particular part of, part of her body. Of course. So, a, a, again, it's a night. I hate to say it's a 90s thing and say that for a whole decade, this is what happened, but pretty much it is. Here's another thing you folks, uh, you kids out there should look up a mall. So, there's a problem at the mall. And you have to remember in the 90s, the mall was the place to be. 80s too, but this is taking place in the late 90s. So, Howard says, catastrophe at the at the mall. Let's see. They ran out of miracle bras. 
The entire shipment of game cartridges all turned out to be Sonic Teaches Typing and Reading Raccoon. The music got stuck and only plays Stairway to Heaven over and over and over and over. And Beverly says, worse. What could possibly be worse than that, Eric? Let's turn the page and find out. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, the, the Muzak uh, situation would be hell to me. So mm -hmm. There's a nice shot of a mega mall. And again, folks, Eric and I can really, I, I, I don't even know how, how much we can let you know that the mall wasn't the big empty building that it is in your neighborhood right now. It was the place to be. It was crowded. There are lights shining all over. They drew this thing like a, a, a beautiful mall that we would love to have gone to back then. But what wound up happening is this, the uh, Santa, the mall Santa, got, I don't know why I'm laughing because it's horrible. He was coming back from his lunch break and his beard got caught in the machinery of the escalator. And let's just say he didn't fare very well. So now Beverly enlists Howard to play Santa. And a foul-mouthed, cigar-chomping, anthropomorphic mm -hmm. duck is mm -hmm. the perfect being to do this. <laughs> and he is sitting in Santa's chair on the next page after he says, I'm not going to do it. And he's doing it, of course. He's in Santa's costume. His arms are crossed. He's got the cigar in his mouth. And he's looking over at the kid who's sitting on the arm of the chair. And it's a very, well, probably like a little young Donald Trump. He's wearing his suit. He's blonde. And he's in the middle of saying what he wants and 500 shares of Microsoft and a platinum canopy fork and two bottles of Lafitte Rothschild 1953 <laughs> and, and on and on and on. Howard tells him to be on his way. So not only is Beverly there, but uh, well, basically he says, why don't you sashay over to see Mei Ling, the Polaroid elf and Bev, the candy cane elf. And he sends the kid on his way. The next kid to come along is kind of like, I don't know, when Oliver Twist goes up and says, please, sir, may I have some more? Little blind kid with a little little stick and says, is this the way to see Santa Claus? I sold all my pencils on the street corner so I could get the bus fare to come here. I've got terminal bron bronchitis. I'm too weak. I can't see. Ten people cut me in line. Uh, so then Howard, you could see he's getting all emotional. And he says, uh, why do you, what do you want for Christmas, kid? I don't want anything for myself. <laughs> it would just be a waste since I won't be around much longer, but oh, that's okay. God. Since I will be out, so since I will be out of my <laughs> pain, you know, it's just that I would like a nice present for my mom. So she won't be so <laughs> sad when I'm gone and so on and so on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so on and so on. And Howard and Mei Ling and Beverly, they're crying. And then Howard's H Howard's got the tears rolling down his face. Uh, is there anything else I could give you? I would like to have a nice uh, hug, Santa. Us poor little blind kids have not fared too well on the advent of work fair and growing middle class intolerance for the destitute, disabled, and disenfranchised. <laughs> oh. That's not funny. <laughs> it's not funny, but why are we laughing? <laughs> Maybe because nothing's changed? I don't oh know. Oh, my God. It would do my little rheumatic heart good to experience the fleeting moment of affection in this otherwise <sighs> cruel and uncaring veil of tears. <laughs> I did not know that Larry Hama was such a comedic writer. He is capable of so much. He's, he's a talent. He's an American treasure. Wow. Uh, so they hug. And he taps his way out of the room. And then who comes bursting in but Judge Elmer Boyd <laughs> asking, have you seen a talking duck? He's a notorious video pilot and he's going to get shot on sight. But then he says, why, he's as high on the most wanted wist as Bernie Blind Boy Buford, the midget pickpocket. And then Howard's like, oh. That little thief snagged my wallet and all my cigars. So that was, that little kid was faking it. Ah. And then Mei Ling's jewelry and camera are missing, and Beverly's candy canes are gone. So now Howard wants to get the kid. But then they realize that they have all these other little wide-eyed anime-looking kids looking up like, uh, is it our turn yet? So then they descend upon Howard, and he has to deal with all those kids. Turn the page. 
Howard gets through all the kids, and then there is one kid left at the end. He says, so Howard says, how much longer can this go on? What are the guidelines from the union on this? And Beverly responds, the end is in sight, Ducky. You're down to the last kid. Now, if we thought that Buford was looked pathetic, here's a snot-nosed punk wearing a Wolverine outfit uh, and goggles, like the goggles the kid had, those, those uh, air, airman goggles that the kid has uh, in uh, A Christmas Story. Remember, Ralph was oh, online with yeah. his brother. Mm-hmm. Okay, so he's wearing some sort of goggles, and he says, am I next? Everybody kept cutting ahead of me online. I guess I look like an easy mark, huh? Well, that's okay. I'm used to being last and miss- missing out on everything. Can I have a candy cane? Sorry, kid, we're all out. Somehow I just knew that was the case. And on the back, uh, somebody put a, you know, where normally there'd be a kick me sign on somebody's back. Yeah. It says, don't mind me, just go ahead. So that's how everybody <laughs> was cutting him in line. <laughs> oh, jeez. All right, so then this kid is, poor, and when he's sucking his thumb, and uh, Howard, again, is uh, being taken in and he goes, uh, what can we do for you, kiddo? Well, for starters, you can go and find my mom. I had a feeling she was cutting out of me again when she put me on the line five hours ago and said she was just going around the corner for a Verner's ginger ale. <laughs> so the kid got dumped there. The parent never came back. Uh, and he says, uh, how can your mom do something to you uh, like this to you? Well, I would like to be called Wolverine, but my real name is Dionysus Finster. My dad thought the name might help me with girls later on in life. So far, it's made my life a living hell, and so on and so forth. Will you be my friend? <laughs> Eric, this, is, this book is fantastic. I'm sorry. I love <laughs> I thought for sure that the hijinks of Archie and the gang and uh, their companion Jingles would be, would be the comedic highlight of this episode. I was sorely mistaken. In fact, you know, I'm glazing over uh, Mr. Finster's uh, explanation of, of, his, of his life being a living in hell. But tell me, this doesn't sound like the life of a podcaster. Last year, I came home from school and they had packed up everything and made a run for Canada. The mount- his parents. The Mounties tracked them down and brought them back. Six months ago, Dad went out for fish sticks and hasn't been seen since. Nobody likes me. Special ed kids give me wedgies. I mean, I'm unpleasant to look at. I sweat a lot. I have no discernible talents. I'm unathletic, dyslexic, socially dysfunctional, mentally mediocre, boring, depressing to be around. I have a rotten personality and a chronic post-nasal drip. Yeah, that sounds like almost like every other podcast I know. Not us, of course. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> but... <laughs> is, is, this, is this commentary about comic book readers? You think that's what Hama's doing here? Probably. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize he has things taped on his face to mimic Wolverine's uh, beard. You know how the beard goes like in his mutton chops? I didn't realize that before. But uh, this whole situation is interrupted as an elf bursts into the room and goes, red alert, massacre at the North Pole, mayhem and mutilation. The old man requires the aid of all his helpers, even up to and including all the venal little Superman, department store Santa clones and pseudo elves. Hydra has taken over Santa's workshop. And unless you all come to Santa's aid, something truly awful will happen. And then there's a little caption that reminds everybody, and for those of you who don't know, the number one worldwide subversive organization dedicated to global domination, true believer, that's what Hydra is. Mm -hmm. So this elf has already been shot up by Hydra, and he dies. (laughs) Jeez. But not before telling Howard that he's got to get on the, uh, the sleigh that's outside with all the other mall santas that he picked up and here are their names Vito claus bubba claus santa clara claus Satung, sanity claus and woolly lumping woolly lumpkin claus <laughs> and of course their drawings are <laughs> let's just say sanity claus is in a straight jacket <laughs> and leave it at that <laughs> all right so all these clauses have to go to the north pole and save santa they're going at uh, super crazy speed, and um, Howard just wants to get everything over w- with and s- start kicking butt. So he he, he gets his uh, parachute on, wants to jump out of the plane, and the elf driving the sleigh says, maybe I should explain a little more about the situation down in the workshop. And Howard doesn't want to hear it, and he goes, come on, let's go. We're, we're going to go, and we're going to save Christmas. Now, meanwhile, the elf said everybody has to go, so that included the little kid that was dressed like Wolverine. Beverly went with Howard, but Mei Ling had to go home to wrap her presents, so she left. So Mei Ling is not there. So it's Howard, Beverly, 
the little kid, and all these other department store Santas. I will admit there is a great picture of Howard with two guns, again, very 90s, two big machine guns with the parachute open, and it's a worm's eye view looking up. It's a, it's a pretty cool shot of Howard, although, you know, again, 90s with all the guns. They get to the North Pole. There is a ton of carnage going on, and they just run in, and they just start killing Hydra agents. A woman comes into the room dressed in a Hydra outfit and says that she told these brain-damaged little elves that they had to knock her out 6,000 Hydra action figures six inches tall. What they did was they gave her 600 figures six feet tall, which is what everybody's fighting, which is why the carnage isn't real carnage, because they're all six foot tall Hydra action figures. Okay. So I guess that's what makes it okay for a kid's comic although it is not approved by the comics code and I'm not judging it's neither here or there. <laughs> but still, I was thinking when you, when you first described that, I'm like, wow, this is, this is getting a little too much for a supposed kids, kids comic. That's also Christmas related. Well, it was a little Lobo like for a little, for a mm. couple of pages there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Now Santa comes running in and says, uh, they couldn't read your handwriting on the memo. They're used to my rather distinctive, Copper plate. Please don't kick any more of the elves out into the cold. Turns out that Santa had hit hard times, and the Hydra be bean counters made a hostile takeover, and now they are the legal owners of Santa Claus, which has a little trademark sign next to it. And the the woman who was dressed in the uh, in the Hydra outfit says, "Right, Lord Bucket gets to be chairman of the board, but I'm the CEO, and I intend to whip this bloated operation into a lean, mean, profit-making machine. No more of this diversity garbage. We are slimming down to just two primary products. All the boys get these correctly sized Hydra action figures. We can get these babies cranked out in China by slave labor for less than two cents apiece." The elbows aren't articulated and the sculpting is crude, but what the hey, that just stimulates the imagination, right? All the girls get this air prancer, and of course it is a, you know, very uh, hourglass curved female Hydra agent with a very short skirt, uh, again, a la the 90s. We get the moldings done in Honduras and India, and then we have the local elves do the finishes. Are we talking low bowl price points or what? Now the Wolverine kid gets mad. He says, you're going to ruin Christmas. Christmas is all I have left. And then he gets all, um, well, actually, this is probably supposed to be like a, like a cartoon character. He goes, ooh, this makes me so mad. You shouldn't make me mad because I am the best at what I do. And then what he does is he uh, uses his claws and uh, kind of hits her where the sun don't shine. And, and not... <laughs> <laughs> and takes her down for the count. And then Howard yells at Santa Claus and says, you cannot sell Christmas. You have to, you have to get it back. And then Santa's inspired and he says, I've been a fool. I sold my integrity to a bunch of bean counters, number crunchers, and corporate mercenaries. I lost track of what was really important, the happiness of little children. Now, where is that little Hydra twerp? So then all the Hydra agents come running out in one way. And all of the Santa Clauses and elves come the other way in two splash pages, uh, like a lot of comic books, how, you know, the covers have, uh, you can have the Avengers on one side ready to fight, maybe the Squadron Supreme coming from the other direction or something oh, like nice. that. So, so that was pretty cool. And they start fighting each other. And a bunch of elves come, uh, the pink slipped elves come in in some sort of, uh, I don't know, transformer type of thing to start blasting away all the Hydra agents. And then Christmas is saved. And the lawsuits begin. Yes. All of the uh, Santa, uh, all of the um, department store, store Santas are lined up almost like uh, in a line, almost like a Star Wars, at the end of Star Wars, where they get their medals. And then the little kid, the little snot nosed punk kid, says, uh, What about me, Santa? I don't have a home to get transported to. And then Santa lifts up the kid and says, You have a home with me as long as you want, son. Ho, ho, ho. You were the one who reminded me what, what what was really important. And then Howard says, you're really going to regret that, buddy. But then, so the kid stays in the North Pole, and now it's Christmas Day. Howard and Beverly are walking down the street, and then they see the little blind kid, that the little fake blind kid. 
So Howard says, you know, that kid's not going to recognize us without being our Santa Claus costumes. So I'm going to get back at this kid. So Howard goes up to the kid and goes, oh, man, you, you know, things are looking rough for you. I just won the lottery. I have 50,000 hard simoleons in my back pocket. So I'm prepared to give you a really big hug and a hefty handout. So the kid goes, OK, give me the hug. And then Howard says, well, turn around because you're facing the wrong way. And then Howard gives him a nice swift kick in the butt. And when he kicks him in the butt, the kid's pockets get emptied and you see all these wallets fall out. And then Howard takes all the wallets and throws them into the bucket of a sidewalk Santa. And it's a very Christmas, very Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. Unless you're a fake blind kid. Wait a minute. Yeah. So where, whatever happened to the Elmer Fudd character? That was it. After, after that time where he explained who the kid was. That he was, he was uh, scamming everybody. He was gone. Oh, that's he never sad. showed up again. Yeah. Uh, dangling plot thread, George. Mm -hmm. and maybe that was in uh, the holiday special 1998. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, two things I do want to point out that I wrote in my notes and I forget where they are exactly, but uh, there is a mention of, uh, I think it's, is it Howard saying it? Somebody says, go Mets. And the Mets are my baseball team mm -hmm. for as lousy as they have been. And somebody says uh, during the battle with the Hydra agent, tall action figures i love the stench of scorched plastic in the morning uh the irreverence the satire it, i just love it and there's so much more in there and the, the stuff in the background that they put in the background ah i, I couldn't get enough of I, I loved rereading this yeah th th that first half of that was i that was that was very fun i enjoyed and, and, that and things the, the, i'm telling you eric larry hama just threw the jokes and and, and the yeah. commentary in there and there's so much in there that just applies today i mean the satire oh, yeah, applies yeah. for today yeah it just uh it, it really was I, in fact i haven't probably read this since i bought it so i'm glad i read it it's the howard the duck special uh issue number uh issue number one from 1997 and it was 250 at the time uh -huh. and who'd you say the artist was on that the artist was let's get back to the book pasquale ferry okay mm -hmm. yeah really really fun stuff all right, we're uh, about at the halfway mark of our little journey. And for my second choice this year, I chose something that this is kind of a actually kind of a preview because it features a character that is very dear to my heart. Um, and but the, the, the comic book is Batman, the Brave and the Bold. This is issue 14. And it says here on the cover, a holiday special featuring, and this is the character, Ragman, that I love. Nice. Hmm. And I'm sure I bought it because, because Ragman's on it. Not, not necessarily that it was a holiday special. So, but this is, this is from, uh, if, if people remember, this is from the Batman. It, it's a comic book in, in the style of the Batman, the Brave and the Bold cartoon series from that time period. So this came out in... Uh, December of 2011, and uh, I f kind of fell in love with that that cartoon. It took me a little bit because of the way the 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 style of it. It was a little too a little too hokey at first for me, but then I kept watching it. And I'm like, no, this is not hokey. This is a love letter to uh, Silver Age Batman stories told you know from a at that time a modern sensibility and this this comic follows the same format uh where there's a there's an there's a short introduction uh with batman teaming up with another character not not the the featured character but another character and this time it's it's blue beetle and then then they get into the main story which is feature uh features ragman so anyway this is called small miracles uh by Sholly fish Rick Burchett, Dan Davis, Guy Major, Desi Siente, Sarah Gatos, and Jim Chadwick. So a lot of a lot of people are involved with this, but it's yeah. it's a I I quite enjoyed this this comic book. Cool. Uh, and the cover, as I showed George in the video here, um, this is this is by Rick Burchett, Dan Davis, and Gabe uh, El Tai El So anyway. What happens in this, so like I said, it, it follows the format of the show. So in the opening scene, Batman and Blue Beetle have teamed up. And I, the only reason I include it, because it does, doesn't really have anything to do with the story at all. But it's just, <laughs> it's bizarre and, and funny 
to me anyway. Uh, so uh, Batman and Blue Beetle have teamed up to stop the combined might of three criminal masters of color. Can you guess who, George? All right, three. No, uh... yeah, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, is there a... <laughs> No, I don't know. I'm not going to try and pretend. Okay, okay. Crazy Quilt, Dr. Spectro, okay, and the Rainbow Raider. Wow, okay. And the funny thing was, I was trying to think of blue, green, yellow, red, like Red Lantern, you know, like I was, that, that's where I was going. So those, <laughs> yeah. those are three better ones than I could ever have thought of. Uh, so anyway, Crazy Quilt, who seems to be the leader of this trio, tells the two heroes to surrender to their demands or, quote, Gotham will never see another white Christmas. Dun, dun, dun. Blue Beetle then asks incredulously, coloring the snow is your master plan? <laughs> uh, and then Batman takes all three out with a bat- with a well-placed battering. <laughs> all right. Cut to Rory Reagan. He's the proprietor of the Rags and Tatters pawn shop, which if you are familiar with Ragman, you you know, that makes sense. You know this, where he's refusing to take his rabbi's father's watch for cash because uh, the rabbi needs money to help pay for repairs to the synagogue. Rory, uh, tell, oh, he, like I said, he refused the money because that's what, that's what Rory does. He, he tries to help out the community as best he can, uh, even though it's a pawn shop, he's supposed to be taking people's money and then reselling things as, as necessary, but he doesn't do that. But he tells the rabbi he's not really religious, to which the rabbi res- uh, asks him not even to light a menorah. Then they both hear a cry for help. The rabbi tells Roy, so the, I got to get, get the action in here. Ra- the rabbi tells Roy to call the police, but Roy exit the, exits the shop after the rabbi leaves and becomes Ragman. Uh, Ragman easily dispatches the thief and is then that Batman just appears. I don't know why, uh, but he's there complimenting Ragman. Uh, Ragman looks at Batman saying, oh, it's you. Not exactly the response that Batman is probably used to <laughs> used to getting when he comes calling. And after some prompting, uh, Ragman lets loose on the Dark Knight uh, detective you don't get down here to my neighborhood very often, Batman. You're too busy uptown, stopping bank robberies and supervillains. Uh, we then get a quick retelling of Ragman's secret origin, how his father started the pawn shop, or junk shop as, as Rory calls it, uh, and passed it on to him when his father died, along with a mystic costume of rags. And I really like how they, the, you know, the, the economy of this, this origin you know, there's because there's a lot more to Ragman than the fact that he just gets this suit of rags, right? But anyway, I so I like that. You know, it's it's a kid's book, so that makes sense. Make it make it uh, make it simple. Uh, Ragman continues his Dark Knight of the Soul journey by asking, "What good is it uh, is it for me to be a superhero when what these people need is rent money and a good meal?" So I think, maybe, so like I said, this came out in uh, late uh, 2011. I don't know when the the comic book discourse began with the whole, well, Batman could could serve people better if Bruce Wayne would just simply invest his money uh, in the community. <laughs> and so it, this kind of, I don't know if this preceded it or if it was, maybe it was going on back then and this is a commentary. I don't know. No, that's the cause. Oh, this it all is, begins it with It all this begins issue. with Batman breaking yeah, the ball. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, uh, Ragman talks about the gentrification of the neighborhood with the, oh, you're going to love this, George, the MacGuffin group, (laughs) uh, which is buying up property Mm. to build luxury apartments, as as Ragman says, that only people like Bruce Wayne could afford. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Uh, Their conversation, however, is cut short when they hear a gunshot. And it's some hoods trying to scare the rabbi away from the synagogue. But not only do Ragman and Batman come to the rabbi's aid, so do several people from the neighborhood. One of the hoods fires into the crowd, but Ragman absorbs the bullets within his suit while Batman takes out the other guy. Ragman apprehends the would-be killer. And then uh, later, Ragman's asking the rabbi, so why do you stay? Why endure this? And the rabbi says, people need places like this. They need me. He then launches into the story of Hanukkah 
and the miracle that occurred over eight days. The rabbi refers to Ragman as a miracle as well. He reminds Roy that the Hanukkah story is to teach us that even though nobody gets everything they want, God gives us what we need. Which is, you know, kind of Chris, uh, uh, Christmassy and, you know, and the fact that, you know, Santa brings presents, but you may not get everything you want, but you, you know, you, you, you sometimes get what you need, but it's more about the, the giving and providing. Uh, it's then that Batman finds a clue on the hood pointing to the MacGuffin group. Ragman declares that the group hired the hoods to drive them all out of the neighborhood. Uh, he intends to confront the group. He's really angry at this point. But Batman tells him Uptown is his responsibility and asks that Ragman let him take care of it. After all, Ragman has plenty to protect right here. Batman does end the MacGuffin group's plan, and Ragman has found a renewed sense of purpose. Later, the rabbi returns to Rags and Tatters to return the money Roy lent him, telling him that the synagogue received an anonymous donation to cover the repairs and some extra leftover for the Hanukkah celebration. And then after the rabbi leaves, Roy takes down the dusty, cobwebbed menorah that was in his shop from the, from the start of the story, cleans it off, and lights the candles. See, that's a great story. I mean, it's not as funny as yours, but no, 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 no. But for like a Christmas comic, that again, if when you and I were starting to read comics, if we picked that up off the shelf, that would have been very satisfying, and I would have reread that sucker mm-hmm. plenty of times. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I, yeah, and you know, some of the things I I kind of responded to. Uh, um, Rory has a, a crisis of faith and self worth. Mm-hmm. And I, and I just really like those, you know, even though I'm not, I'm not religious, kind of like, kind of like Rory is at the beginning of the story. <laughs> it was also kind of nice to see Batman get a little pushback. You know, he, you know, he's used to coming in and being the big man on campus and everybody kind of bows to his, his superiority. And he wasn't getting any of that from Batman. Not that, not that he expects it. Right. But, but it, one thing that, uh, that I skipped over though, he, he says in here, He's had similar conversations with superpowered heroes where he's on basically Ragman's side of it. Mm, mm-hmm. And so he's not used to that. So I thought that was nice. But, you know, it shows Batman. He's not he's he's smart enough, obviously, he's Batman, yeah. to not try and solve everything for other people, right? Mm-hmm. So I, mm-hmm. I, I appreciated that. He just kind of he was he re- he recognized the situation and he just kind of backed off. Unlike what he did at the beginning, where he just took care of the 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 three colorful crim- criminals mm-hmm. without I mean Blue Beetle didn't even get a chance to do anything and so this time he you know even Batman can learn a lesson right mm. and then we also we uh, when I said they uh, the rabbi told the story about about Hanukkah we got a mm-hmm. complete full page telling that story and oh great mm-hmm. and I, I you know I you know I'm not Jewish um, I know of the story and all this stuff but I thought it was nice that that we get that. You know, it's not just him talking about it. It's actually shown on the page. It's a, a full page telling that whole story. I thought, well, that's that was nice to see that because you don't. I don't think you really get to see a whole lot of Jewish uh, religious material in superhero comics, right? Yeah. Um, even it, despite you know the number of superheroes that are Jewish, we don't just get a whole lot of that. And like I, you know, like I said, the MacGuffin Group. You know, I just thought that was just <laughs> that was just perfect. So. Good, good stuff there. Yeah, that's a great book. Wow. What year was that again? That, that was relatively... 2011. 2011, which would, would have coincided with the show, right? God, it doesn't seem yeah. that long ago, but I guess the show was on over 10 years ago. Wow. Oh, and like I said, uh, this is at the beginning of this. This is kind of a preview because I do plan to do a, a spotlight on Ragman oh. sometime in 2024. Cool. Okay. That, that is awesome. Coming attractions. All right, shall we do my last one? Yes, let's get to it. Okay. Can can you top Howard the Duck? No, I cannot. But please don't press pause or fast forward, folks. But normally in the past, I have unconsciously done, and I can't say I did this every year, but for some reason in my head, I think I had a habit of doing one Marvel, one DC, and then one independent. It wasn't really planned that way, it just worked out that way. Well, this year I had one Marvel, one DC, but I have a second DC. Oh my gosh. And now we're jumping almost 20 years into, 
to the future. Uh, what was the other one? The other one was 97. Okay, we're a little over 20 years in the future. So like I said, there were 20-year increments in between each of my books. So now we're in 2018, and the book is Teen Titans Go, number 25. You, you look uh, quizzical there. What, what, what's wrong? No, no. Uh, I was just. Are you, are, are you surprised that I had a Teen Titans Go or another DC book, or what, what were you surprised? Well, about? knowing because you told me which books you had, um, uh-huh. I actually was going to pull uh, pull it up so I can kind of follow along with you. And okay. As fate would have it, George. So, mm-hmm. so there there are basically uh, two volumes of Teen Titans Go, mm-hmm. and I'm looking at the wrong issue. But, oh my goodness! But issue twenty-five of this volume, which came out in two thousand five, mm-hmm. is also a Christmas. Is it really? Yes. You know what? Okay, you're you're going to find out in a moment why I specifically I've picked this specifically because you and I are going to be talking. You know, if if it was anybody else, I might not have picked this one. But I picked this specifically because it's us, you and me. And, and the lovely listeners out there. But this might be why the cover... Well, could, could you tell me what's on the cover of the 2005 one? Do you have it up? Oh, I just I just went away from it to, to get the oh, other okay. one. Um, right. uh, but it's 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 the, the group uh, together. It looks like they're singing like Christmas carols or something. Okay, okay. Then, well, I mean, this, I picked this because, I mean, I read this when it came out. And... All these years that we've been doing this, it was after we had our discussions. I said, darn it, why didn't I get that? Why didn't I do that Teen Titans Go book? And a year would go by. Darn it, why didn't I do the Teen Titans Go book? And you're going to find out why in a moment. I hope you're not reading ahead. Much like an Archie comic, in this book, there are two stories. The first story is called Oil's Well. Beast Boy. Oh, and I'll, I'll get into the credits here. In a, well, here, I'll give you the credits. And actually, you're, you're going to find a, a one name familiar to you based on your last book. The story we're talking about now is written by Sh- Sholly Fish, who ah, does yeah. does a great job with, with these books. Yep. Need a freaking my, my magnifying glass with this one. Uh, <laughs> I wonder why you pulled up a magnifying glass. Yeah. Art, color, and cover by Leah Hernandez. Letters by Wes Abbott. And it's edited by Christy Quinn. So that's the first story. But Charlie Fish, boy, really can do, do a good job with these books. The story opens with Beast Boy getting into the Hanukkah spirit, despite not being Jewish. He buys a menorah and Hanukkah sweaters for all the Titans, but none of them are Jewish either. Why is he doing this? His response? Eight days of presents, dude. As Raven admonishes him, a time now, what is it a time bubble like uh, what Rip Hunter travels in? It's a time bubble, right? But what, what, what do you call that round time machine thing that they use? Is it, it well, th- it, th- that's what we call it in the Legion. It's a time bubble, but I, yeah, time I, bubble. Okay, well, perfect that we use the term then because a time bubble appears with none other than the self proclaimed Jewish member of the Legion of Superheroes. Colossal, Colossal Boy, Boy yes. <laughs> so is, is, is it well known that Colossal Boy is the token Jewish member of the Legion of Superheroes? I think so. And and actually, we had I had talked about this, uh, I think, last year okay. with, with the, the story, the, the Superboy and the Legion story that I that I chose. Oh, I don't remember. OK. I know from listening to you and Peter especially do the Legion Project podcast that Part of the charter, at least at the beginning, was there each member had to have what one power, and they couldn't have the same power. Right. Is that what it was? Yeah. So, him specifically saying he's the Jewish member of the Legion of Superheroes because that's how he introduces himself. <laughs> Does that mean you can only have one religion in <laughs> in in the? In the uh, Legion, I, I don't recall you and Peter ever bringing that up. That might break a few um, United Planets laws or something. I don't know. <laughs> okay. And then one other question. Is Colossal Boy the Earth-based Legion of Superhero member? Because no, is he's not the Judaism only Judaism in space? Oh, but he is Earth-based. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's from Earth. Okay. Because I was going to say, 
So does this mean Judaism and Catholicism and all sorts of other religions are out there in space? So now, now this makes sense. Okay. I would assume so. Yes. Okay. All right. Anyway, <laughs> so Colossal Boy, what he has done is he has <laughs> he has gone back in time as is the tradition in the 30th century where the Legion of Superheroes are. He's gone back to eight. He thinks he has gone back to ancient times to witness the legend of Hanukkah actually take place. But he undershot it by 2000 years. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. must, it must have been that that uh, pesky old time trapper messing with things. Yeah. <laughs> right. The time trappers really screwed him up. In fact, what was the uh, what was the miniseries that you and Peter did a Tales of the Legion project podcast about with the time trapper with the Legionnaires three? Is Legionnaires that what it three. was? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this might be the unofficial sequel to Legionnaires three. Although Colossal Boy wasn't one of the three Legionnaires in that issue, right? No. All right, but uh, you know maybe I'm I'm going for a stretch here. For, uh, I got to get this we, issue. <laughs> <laughs> now, no matter what they do to try to convince him. Well, I mean, they don't really do too much to convince him, but they try to convince him that he's undershot his goal. But then they realize, well, he's, you know, he's not listening to us. So maybe what we've got to do is make him think he's 3,000 years in his past rather than 1,000 years in his past. And what we're going to do is we're going to basically act out uh, the whole the whole thing with the uh, the Maccabees. Uh, you know, being outgunned, but miraculously defeating uh, the Syrian army that's uh, coming to Jerusalem, and uh, you know, basically the story of Hanukkah that was on on that one page in your rag, uh, in your Brave and the Bold book. So they're going to act it out, and they and they figure they have all of the things they need because Beast Boy has already supplied them with all the Hanukkah supplies. Ah, menorah, of course, the connection. They, okay. Uh huh. Uh, they've got the latkes, uh, which, of course, uh, Beast Boy and Cyborg are really happy about. So Colossal Boy is content with being in the background while all of this stuff takes place. Uh, and one of the jokes is after the, the Titans decide this is the plan of action that they're going to take rather than try to convince Colossal Boy he's in 21st century. And, <laughs> you know, yes, because. Because a, a, a person from an advanced technological society a thousand mm -hmm. years in the future is going to buy this. Right. Well, you know, when you you give or take the technology a, a thousand years, two thousand years in the past, to him, all of this is primitive anyway. Well, that okay. I, I, oh, I sure, guess, right? Sure. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, and of course, Titan's Tower is the great temple, you know, because it, it's a T, you know, T for temple. Mm hmm. Uh, and then so Cyborg dresses up in a Scottish outfit and has bagpipes and he goes, Hoot man, Merry Hanukkah to you. Just call me Judah McAbby. And then Raven corrects him and says, Not McAbby, Maccabee. The Maccabees were Jewish, not Scottish. Oh my god. And he says, Oh man, did they at least play bagpipes? I've been practicing Hava Nagila. <laughs> Okay, so then we move on, and basically what winds up happening, thank goodness, thank goodness, the Hive Five decide to attack the Titans. And when they when they just appear out of nowhere, Robin goes, it's the Hive Five, I mean the Syrian Greek Five. And then <laughs> they start fighting each other, <laughs> and you see Colossal Boy, now Colossal Boy has shrunk down to regular human size, He's sitting on the sidelines in a chair eating popcorn with a pendant in his hand that says Mac for the Maccabees. Hmm. Then they realize, uh-oh, part of the story of Hanukkah is the temple gets destroyed. So they're, they're winning against the, the Hive Five, uh, and they say, oh, no, we've got to let them destroy Titan's Tower. So Robin goes, okay, go ahead, wreck the tower. And they're like, oh, this is a trick. Robin's like, no, just wreck the tower. And Gizmo, Gizmo is one of the five, you know, going, I'm not going to do it. And uh, what Raven does, she casts a spell and she hits uh, Cyclops. I don't know what the, the Cyclops guy, uh, what's his name? Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Over here. Oh, Seymour. Sorry. So Seymour accidentally, because Raven casts a spell and hits him in the butt. And, and just just so people know, it's it's spelled S E E dash. M-O-R-E, C-more. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, sorry, that, that 
<laughs> that is important to know, and that his name isn't just Seymour. So now that Seymour has blasted the, the tower and put a, you know, blasted a room, the high five are like, uh oh, I guess he shouldn't have done that. And then now that the, the tower, it's not totally destroyed, but it, it's wrecked a little bit. Now the Titans can go defeat the supposed Sir- Syrian army because now they've destroyed the, uh, the temple. But unfortunately, Colossal Boy grew to his colossal size and he steps on the five villains. And he says, Oh, sorry about that. I really have to watch where I put my feet. So they're defeated, they're dispatched, and then wait, they go, okay. Wait, that, wait, that, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Defeated. <laughs> defeated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that was our joke, folks. That is not in the book. Right. Anyway. Yeah, they lost out on that. Now they, they have to get oil. And of course, Cyborg has a ton of oil. Oh, of course. His, yeah. his, you know, Cyborg parts. But the problem is, Colossal Boy knows his history and he says, wait, aren't the containers supposed to be broken? So, of course, Cyborg blasts all the oil. And then <laughs> they didn't realize that Colossal Boy had the three, what, what do you call the three dots uh, at the end of a sentence? An ellipsis? Uh, what, what is ellipsis? it? Ellipsis? Mm-hmm. They didn't realize he had an ellipsis at the end of his word balloon because he was also about to say, <laughs> except one small jug that's still unharmed. And of course, Cyborg destroyed all the oil. And of course, he says, well, you could have mentioned that part earlier. Beast Boy knows where to get oil because they have leftover pizza and the couch cushions in the living room. So Beast Boy is grabbing pizza from the couch oh, cushions to get the oil. Gross. But... He had. I, I neglected to tell you folks this, but uh, Beast Boy had used a menorah on Mammoth. Is that is that the big guy mm-hmm. in the? Okay, he used the menorah to hit Mammoth, and the menorah is broken now. But Robin says he has an idea, and Colossal Boy, an idea. It's a Hanukkah miracle. So what they decide to do is they use Titan's Tower itself as a menorah. Okay. So Colossal Boy grows. He lights eight large candles at the top of Titan's Tower. And Cyborg finally gets his latkes. And as they sit there basking in the, the glow of the candlelight at the top of Titan's Tower with Colossal Boy towering over Titan's Tower, Robin says, at least now we know what we want for Christmas, a new tower. <laughs> the end. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. How, wait. You said Colossal Boy lit candles? On top of Titan's Tower. Were they, were they giant candles? Yeah, they're giant candles. Come on, Eric. Giant candles. Can't you see? Where did they come from? You know what? They they just were there. They. I know. I'm I'm thinking about it too much. Yeah. Well, Robin said he had an idea. So who? <laughs> maybe they're bat candles. I don't know. They. Ah, okay. They look yeah. not. Well, I. They look nondescript. They, they just look like candles. So I mean, they don't look like anything special or any Easter egg or anything like that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I, this is why I picked the issue for you because I knew Colossal Boy was Perfect. in it. I forgot the details, of course, but I knew Colossal Boy was in it. Just so you know, I like I said uh, in another volume of of this series, um, mm-hmm. issue twenty five is also a Christmas story. But what I what I just discovered as mm-hmm. as you were going through this, your story. What what was it called? The, what was the name of the, the story? Oil's Well. Oil's Well is actually issue forty nine of the DC digital comic that it was called Teen Titans Go. Hmm. So which would have come first, I guess. And then they put it in print. And then they printed it in issue 25 of of the print I version. See. Yes. Okay. Hmm. So okay. yeah, I was actually uh about halfway through I was starting to follow along. I didn't I didn't look ahead though, George. Um, okay. <laughs> so yeah, so I just wanted to see what Colossal Boy looked like in this. So great artwork in both stories. The uh, second story is called Claws of the Batman. Written by Sholly Fish, art by Marcelo De Chera, colors by Franco Riso, letters by Wes Abbott, and it's edited by Christy Quinn. Now, this is going to be a little similar to your Jingle story from before, where Jingle didn't believe that Santa was Santa or St. Nicholas was Santa. Mm-hmm. In this issue... Well, it begins <laughs> it begins with Beast Boy singing Jingle Bells, Batman Smells, Robin Laid Egg, and, and, and Robin not being too happy about it. Uh. Also, as he's doing that and Robin's attacking him with his bow staff uh, and Beast Boy's flying away as a bird, 
Cyborg is hanging his stocking, but his stocking is a giant metal boot, and it breaks the drywall that the tinsel holding the other stockings are, and, you know, the drywall breaks and everything like that. But Beast Boy is thinking a little bit as they're talking about, wait a minute, he sees you when you're asleep or awake. He's got a list of who's been bad or good. And then he gets this epiphany. Santa Claus is Batman. That's why it's called Claws of the Batman. So Robin says, you're crazy. Batman's not Santa Claus. I, if anybody would know that, I would know. I would hope Robin and, would try to correct this misconception. But like most conspiracy theories, <laughs> the other people, the other Titans start to buy into it because the explanation seems to make sense to them. Because everything that Robin is saying, Beast Boy can counter with something that Batman does. And one of the one of the one of the early ones was Santa will have to give me toys now that I've uncovered his secret identity. And then Robin's like, that's ridiculous. Santa Claus is not Batman. Have you ever seen them together? And then then Starfire's like, actually, I do not believe I have seen the Batman and the Santa Claus together. Raven's like, huh, why don't you think about it? I mean, they both creep around in people's houses at night. <laughs> they both hang around with short guys in, in red. And then Robin's like, short guys, that's me. I'm no elf. And then Cyborg says, tell that to the pixie boots you used to wear. Oh. <laughs> so everything is, you know, right? This, oh my gosh, this is so good. And of, of course, every, everybody's countering all of Robin's arguments. One of, the, one of the things that Beast Boy says is, obviously, Batman just tells everyone that there's that he li- that Santa's in the North Pole as misdirection because the Batcave is really where the toys are made. So there really is nothing in, in the North Pole. And then Robin's like, misdirection? Why would Batman want to send people to the North Pole? And then he starts thinking. Oh, no. He's, he's starting to buy into it? Yeah. Oh, he no. starts thinking about a time where... Batman and Commissioner Gordon were pranking Superman in the Fortress of Solitude. He goes, hmm, maybe Batman would send people to the North Pole after all. We'd better investigate. Because he's thinking people go to the North Pole as a prank to bother Superman in his Fortress of Solitude. So now they go to the Batcave. And they start looking around, and of course things are fitting into place because uh, Batman has this table with all of his wigs and his makeup and they say, the disguise area has a beard like Santa's. And then Starfire says, and the eye patch. Does Santa Claus also wear the eye patch? <laughs> so then Robin lays out cookies and milk as like the perfect surefire Santa detector. But Cyborg eats all the cookies and the milk. They put out another thing of cookies and milk. And then it disappears. But that's because Alfred takes the cookies and milk away, saying, I do wish Master Bruce would stop leaving snacks around the bad cave. It's challenging enough dealing with the guano. Then they talk about things like uh, on Christmas Eve when Robin thinks Batman is off Carolyn at police headquarters, which is reminiscent of that uh, the Neil Adams famous Batman story where he's singing Christmas carols. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they have a little picture of Batman singing Christmas carols. And Beast Boy saying, well, everybody thinks he's doing that. He's really soaring through the midnight sky in a Batmobile pulled by eight tiny bats. And then Raven asks, don't you mean reindeer? And he says, who can tell at 30,000 feet? <laughs> and then it keeps going on and on about that, you know, and they're starting to buy into it. So who should come into the Batcave but Batman and Commissioner Gordon? And then Robin's a little embarrassed and everybody's, you know, like, uh, you know, sweating it out. And Robin says, fancy meeting you here, huh? We were just uh, conducting an investigation. And uh, like you always say, we have to follow the uh, evidence wherever it leads us. So we were wondering. And then Starfire interrupts and says, are you perhaps the Santa Claus? So Batman and Commissioner Gordon look at each other and they start laughing and the uh, Titans, especially Robin, you know, he's got the, he's blushing and they walk out dejected with their shoulders all hunched as they're walking out and they leave the Batcave and now you have some silent panels, Batman and Commissioner Gordon look at each other. Batman looks at his watch, which has bat and, you know, Mickey Mouse watches that have the Mickey Mouse hands. So his is a Batmite watch uh, with the hands. Batmite would be so happy to know that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then Batman puts a Santa Claus hat on. He says, ho, ho, ho. No. And and then he's singing fa-la-la-la-la as his Batmobile is flown through the sky 
Oh by, no! No. By nine tiny bats because the ninth one has a red nose like Rudolph, and that man has a sack of presents. So, folks, I guess conspiracy theories are real. <laughs> the end. Oh my god! And, and what's fun about this is a little hidden word puzzle at the back has nothing to do with Christmas or anything. And then there are two character sheets for uh, the cartoon version, the Young Justice versions of Wonder Girl and Blue Beetle. But, yep, that was fun. Charlie Fish. The master of these kind of books. So, the, the, uh, uh, just so people know, if you want to, if you have the DC Universe Infinite Access, um, uh, that story is issue 50 in the digital mm. comic. So, they just cool. put those two together, I guess, and into issue yeah. 25 of, of what you have. Mm. So, that was fun. Yeah. That was fun. And the way, especially the first story where it was drawn with everybody wearing their Hanukkah sweaters, almost like ugly Christmas sweaters. Oh, yeah. It, it was kind of cute because at least the first part of the story, they're not not—they're wearing them over their costumes. So it was kind of cute. You know, it just got you in the holiday spirit with, the, with those uh, sweaters. You, you know, like I said about uh, Batman, the Brave and the Bold, the cartoon, right? Uh, the Teen Titans Go stuff took me a little while to warm up to as well. But once I did... I mm-hmm. just I adore that cartoon. I find it very humorous. It's mm. it's so slapsticky, and uh, you know it 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 fits my my inner child's uh, sense of humor so well. So I, <laughs> I I just adore and and obviously the comic book, you know, Shelly Fish and and the the artists doing this stuff. They 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 are channeling the the, the cartoon sensibility very well. I didn't mention the cover, and by the way, the cover price was two ninety nine. Uh, it's the it's the five titans is a large. I'm gu- I'm guessing it's a large chocolate coin. Oh yeah, it is a large chocolate coin because it looks like it's one of the. Uh, it looks like it's the penny in in the bat cave because uh, you could. But it's a wrapper that's being torn, and uh, cyborg is just sticking his face in the chocolate, eating the chocolate coin. Uh, Beast boy as a reindeer, Starfire and Raven in their Hanukkah sweaters are playing with the dreidel and it seems like Starfire keeps winning all the gold coins and Robin is decorating the Christmas tree. There's a Christmas tree with uh, batarangs and you see Santa's hand grabbing Robin's shoulder and him being surprised and throwing a batarang in the air. Uh, so, so it's a cute cover and uh, in, in the Teen Titans go uh, style. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Okay. So I guess what well, mine's the last one, right? You, that was your third. Yes. One? Yeah. Okay. Bring All it right. home, Eric. So I guess we're going to continue our theme of somewhat humorous Christmas stories, uh, with, with some, uh, a bunch of violence thrown in for good measure. So, like I said, I was looking for something different this year. So I started with Archie. Yeah. I veered back into my normal, uh, uh, Avenue, with with the the Batman comic, but this one, this one was a complete uh, surprise uh, to me. So uh, I can't wait. I can't wait. As I as I always do, because I don't know. I, I don't know. I searched my comic book database for you know Christmas, Xmas, holiday, looking for something, and this uh, this is a uh, a digital comic that I I got in a humble bundle. It's it's from Image Comics, but it was originally, uh, if I if I can if I understand this correctly, it was originally on Webtoons. I don't know if you've ever perused that website, George. I have not. I'm aware of it, but I'm I'm really not a digital. Uh, to this day, I'm still not really a digital comic reader. The only thing I ever really per, uh, really went to back and forth to was a comic, ironically enough, Eric called The Gutters. <laughs> okay, I don't yes, know if you know, I, if you I know am that. aware of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But of course that was like 10 years ago when like the interwebs was in its infancy and I guess blogs were a big thing and stuff like that, but that was something I would I would go back to, but I haven't even thought about that for at least a decade <laughs> until you mentioned something like that. But no, no, I've never gone on the webtoons before. Okay, so this this particular comic mm. from webtoons it was reprinted in the image comics collection mm-hmm. of street angel by Jim Ruck. Okay. 
And uh, uh, George, are you are you seeing what I shared with you? Are you seeing the? Y- yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So um, I can follow along. Yes. <laughs> but um, anyway, so Street Angel <laughs> is. Oh wait, I'm this. Oh yeah, it's gonna it's gonna change to my my notes, George. Um. Yeah. So hold on, let me. That's not gonna work like I thought. <laughs> <laughs> but you saw, you saw, uh, you saw the, the, the cover. You, there. Say, you said Jim Rugg, right? Yeah. So that's the, uh, he does the comics kayfabe, uh, YouTube channel with Ed Pisco, right? Oh, I'm not, I didn't, I'm not aware of that. Okay. Oh, okay. I, th- I think that's who, 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 uh, does it with them. I haven't watched them. Uh, my co-host Rodney's a big fan of the, uh, cartoonist kayfabe YouTube channel. Okay. And I think, okay. I think he's, I think he's one of the two who does that. So, uh, yeah, so Street Angel is, like I said, the name of the, 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 the book. And this is the Street Angel Christmas uh, special. It's Xmas special. <laughs> and um, on, on the Webtoons version, as George saw, there, there, it's, there, there, there's some color to it. You know, it's like a two or three color, co- two or three colors being used here. But in the version that I have originally uh from the Hubble bundle it was all black and white which i actually kind of like better uh actually uh comparing the two but anyway this is what happens I, and I'll, I'll get into what who straight angel is because that's actually part of the story but here here's the the story the the, the christmas special a a man dressed as santa is walking the winter city streets calling names noah colton kaylee street angel arrives and tells tells him to shut the f up and they they don't um they don't editorialize uh in this in the story she th- but she thinks he's had too much to drink and recommends he call it calls it a night uh he replies though merry christmas jesse have you seen any reindeer around here uh jesse G- street angel uh, replies do i know you uh santa says santa claus knows all the boys and girls also, he tells her that his sleigh is gone. It turns out that some ninjas ninjas took the sleigh to a chop shop, but, but they find that there's nothing on board. They resolve to find Santa, go back and find Santa, and steal his magic bag, which they do very quickly because, you know, of the yelling that he keeps, that Santa keeps doing. <laughs> uh, Street Angel announces herself to the ninja but they don't believe that she is actually Street Angel for some reason, uh, and they demand Santa's bag. Uh, Street Angel, however, wastes no time in attacking them, and then we're treated to this brief overview of, of Street Angel's origin as she fights the ninja. So it says here, uh, Orphaned by the world, raised by the streets, Jesse Sanchez is a kung fu master. And the world's greatest homeless skateboarder. In Wilkesboro, Angel City's deadliest ghetto, she fights ninjas, drugs, nepotism, and pre-algebra as Street Angel. (laughs) Isn't that great? (laughs) Uh, After she takes care of the assembled ninja and saves Santa's butt, uh, Santa yells yells out again and tells Street Angel that the reindeer are nearby. Then the reindeer appear and with a sleigh trailing behind them. Santa asks Street Angel if she'd like to help deliver presents and interrupts him with an emphatic yes as she jumps into the sleigh. Uh, mm-hmm. But then Santa says, well, actually, my last stop is just around the corner. It's yeah. probably just easier to walk. <laughs> he tells her that there are only 14 good kids this year. Hmm. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> uh, when they arrive at their destination, Street Angel recognizes the house as Melody's, the girl she thinks is fake and sarcastic. Santa corrects her. I think the word you're looking for is nice. <laughs> when they return to the sleigh, Street Angel asks Santa if he might have a present for her. Boots, maybe. New boots, maybe. Hmm. Santa's like, but you hurt so many people this year, not to mention all the ninja. 20 minutes ago. Straight Angel protests, after all, that was self-defense and, you know, helping Santa out and all. But Santa says, maybe next year. <laughs> Santa then calls, uh, calls out to all his reindeer. Now Noah, now Colton, now Kaylee and Mason. 
on Randolph, on Blitzen 2, on Lexi and Brayden. Street Angel asks incredulously, you've been calling to them the whole time? What about Rudolph and all the others? Reindeer aren't immortal, dear, Santa says. <laughs> and the names of those reindeer, I hate to interrupt you, but those rain, the names of those reindeer sound like, uh, I don't know if you know the old George Carlin sketch about names where he didn't like names like Colton and Todd, even Todd. He didn't like Todd. I, I, I don't remember all the names, but uh, those names, he, 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 he wanted to know what happened to names like Michael and John and Joe. So that that just reminded me, except for the Blitzen too, of course, <laughs> re- reminded me of that George Carlin sketch. Uh, those of you listening who know, uh, hashtag live tweet at Meanwhile ATP and uh, give me a clip of that. <laughs> uh, well, and that's pretty much it. Santa then takes to the sky, wishing everyone a Merry Christmas. Nice. So, I mean, but this she is... still didn't get a gift. No, no, because oh, you know. And wait, and did she lose the boot by just leaving it up the ninja's butt, kicking ass? <laughs> No, she didn't. She didn't actually lose a boot. She just needs new boots, you know, because she just needs because boots. she's okay. a homeless skateboarder. That was um, true, right? Uh, yeah. Kung fu master. So mm-hmm. yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, this is just silly, silly fun. That is good stuff. I like I said, I so there will be a link in the show notes for the webtoons version of this. So people who want to go mm. check this out. Uh, like I said, it's in it's in, in uh, two or three colors, but um, either way, I mean, this was just it was just fun. You know, it, it kind of reminded me of like. Uh, what if the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were a homeless girl, <laughs> right? <laughs> who, who 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 then teams up with Santa Claus? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, the story again, kind of like the Archie stuff. It's 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 little more than a than a gag strip, mm-hmm. you know, and sort of a, a slightly dour punchline setup. But you know, yeah. whatever. But I like the frenetic energy of it. It's just, uh, like I said, George, you got, you got to check this out. Okay. Uh, sometime after we're done recording, because it's just the way that the that rug does the the kind of like the page layouts and and uh, over the over the top when Santa's yelling the names they're just <laughs> huge in the panel, you know. And to, he does it all right. He uh, does as far it. as I could tell, yeah, there were no other right. credits for this. Yeah. So yeah, it yeah. was it was just a lot of fun. And like I said, something really different than I would normally choose. So there you go. Right. Very good. And that's what's great about this this episode we do every year. One of the reasons why it's one of my favorite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, like you you had you had some great entries this year, George, and 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 like I said, I I I need to find the Howard the Duck and the the Teen Titans go at least. They, they are they're going to be perennial now. I'm going to they're going to be up there with the Christmas story, I think, especially that Howard the Duck one. Now that I've rediscovered it, this year I got a Howard the Duck. I think it was this year a Howard, one of the old Howard the Duck magazines. And if I recall correctly, it was Christmas themed. And, and as I was reading it in the summertime when I got it, I was thinking about using that one, but for some reason I maybe because it was so long, you know, because those magazines have a lot in it. And if I, if I was going to talk about the magazine, I think I'd want to talk about the whole thing. And then that would have taken up the entire four hours that we've been talking now. So I that's why I went to the ninety seven one, which did not disappoint me at all. I mean, I know Larry Hama now is going back to G- continuing with G.I. Joe now that it's an Im- image, but uh, he does more than just G.I. Joe. Don't yeah. forget, folks. Yeah, yeah, I had no idea. So that, that was a, mm-hmm. that's a wonderful discovery. Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it. Yeah. Christmas Gab Bag 2023 is, is officially over, or is it? <laughs> there might be a little surprise at the end of this episode. Or there Ooh, might not. I I, you know, it depends if you're naughty or nice, I suppose. Are you telling me this has been Christmas Eve and the end of this episode is going to be Christmas Day? <laughs> <laughs> you wake up and you discover it is still Christmas Day. <laughs> you wake up and you still discover that George is trying to describe a Teen Titans Go comic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, you know, I, I think on, on the behalf of, of George and, and uh, uh, myself, I would just want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy Holidays. And I hope everybody has a great 2024. George, do you have anything else for the our fine listeners uh, in relation to either Christmas comics or the holidays or whatever? I just want to reiterate what Eric just said. Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy New Year. I hope it's a happy, healthy one. 
Mm, healthy. Yes. And thank you, you. And you know something? Go out there, get your Christmas comics, whether they're in your long box. If you listen to the show, you must have comics, and there's got to be some holiday-themed comic in that long box. Or let's go to your comic book store. There are a lot of good new ones this year. Well, and didn't I think DC just uh, it just dropped on on the on the DC app? There's the new oh man, I and I saw it. I don't remember what it what it's called now. There, uh, I think it's a Batmite. Uh, yeah, the, related the title, before Christmas, the might before Christmas. Thank you, mm-hmm. thank you. Yes. Yeah, so mm-hmm. I still have to read that. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go read that uh, this weekend. Uh oh, we didn't even end the episode. Yet. I know, and I'm already 24. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I did actually. Uh, if people are following me on on Blue Sky, I did. Uh, I may have done it on Twitter as well. But anyway, I I uh, sent out a link to all of the holiday comics that DC had kind of collected with this one, like I said, this one link. So um, there's a bunch of them that I've not read. So mm-hmm. I, you know, fodder for next year or next yeah. year's. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Something to sit by the fire with this winter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And actually, you know, I, I would love it if our listeners would suggest some uh, comics that we've not, we've not read that we could cover and future in, uh, installments of the Gab Bag. It's too late. I already have my three for next year. <laughs> well, I don't. So, you know, any help okay. I can get, uh, that would be appreciated. So anyway, <laughs> George, thanks for, again, uh, joining me on this me. journey. I This is this is, this is is uh, one of my favorite things to do every year. So thank you. Same here. Of course, now what I have to look forward to is coming up with my... Uh, my favorites of the year episode, which that'll take a while, you know, maybe by March <laughs> I'll have it out. <laughs> I'm not like, well, you, I'm not like you. <laughs> but, well, we, we, we don't do a best stuff uh, because we figure we haven't all, all four of us on the show haven't taken in enough of TV comics, movies. But what we do do is uh, the last weekend of the year this year, we are scheduled to have Brian Loy on, who is uh, a creative manager over at the Alamo Draft House here in my area. And what he does, while he doesn't do a whole Oscar type of thing, 10 best films of the year, he talks about his 10 favorite mm-hmm. films of the year and acknowledges he hasn't seen everything, which is something I guess we could do. But you know what? There are so many other podcasts out there that do a best of a lot better than we could ever do that we don't even try. So we leave it to Brian as a guest to talk about the year in film, but we don't do a best of, you know, comics or anything like that on our show. We'll leave that to folks like you, Eric. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to live up to that uh, <laughs> expectation. Anyway, I'm looking very much looking forward to Brian Loy on the Meanwhile uh, at the podcast episode coming up at the end of December. Yes. Near the end of December. Okay. Uh, because that's one of my favorite uh, things that you do as well on the show. So He's a great guy. Love having him on. And I will have, of course, as I always do, links in the show notes uh, to the podcast, to the various social media um, uh, accounts that you guys have so that uh, people can can uh, listen and um, uh, respond and all that good stuff. So thank you. All right. Well, with that, I think, George, we're done and uh, another gab bag over and uh, just in time for Christmas and uh, a visit from Santa Claus or, you know, whatever whatever deity or <laughs> you, you believe in for, for that kind of stuff. Anyway, with that, I think, I think uh, we could say good night and good luck and all that good stuff. And we'll talk to you next year. And now our present to you, a dramatic reading of present tense by Ty Templeton, originally published in DC universe holiday bash two. You bring news? Please don't kill me, Great Dark Side. He has gotten past all the perimeter defenses. Satellites disabled, flying parademons helpless. Ground forces and air missiles are ineffective. He's here. On the planet's surface? So easily? No, Great Dark Side. In this room. Oh, ho, ho, you're making it tougher to get here each year, I'll give you that. But we each have our duties to perform, young fella, and I have to go about mine. Oh, definitely naughty. It's a lump of coal for you again. Do 
not let him leave here alive. Oops, gotta go. See you next year. Ho, 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 ho. Happy Christmas. <laughs>